The Meeples and Miniatures Podcast, episode 151. Halo Fleet Battles. With hosts Neil Shook, Mike Hobbs and Mike Whittaker, and guests Neil Fawcett and Derek Sinclair from Spartan Games. Welcome to episode 151 of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. Uh, I'm Neil Shook, and on this show I'm joined by Mike Whittaker. Hello. And Mike Hobbs. Hello. And I, we get to chat this evening to Neil Fawcett from Spartan Games, uh, who you may remember was the instigator of what forever, forever from now on will be known as... Mr. Whittaker? The Halo. The Halo pause. Indeed. The unit, the unit of stunned silence, <laughs> which was at, at, which was at, almost aptly uh, demonstrated at, uh, uh, while Mike was trying to trying to work out what the heck I was thinking. Uh, what, what, what the heck <laughs> no, I was he was, he was trying to find his on mute button actually. <laughs> <laughs> Superb, and that's staying in the edit. Yes, so uh, so we're talking uh, we're talking to uh, Neil Fawcett from Spartan Games, and uh, this time we're also speaking to game designer Derek Sinclair, who is uh, one of the main rules authors of Spartan Games at the moment. Uh, we spoke to Derek briefly uh, on the Salute Show, uh, as well as Neil, uh, and they uh, very kindly agreed to come on and chat to us all about Halo Fleet Battles. If I got my timing right. Uh, this is released either immediately on the eve or on the day of release of Halo Fleet Battles. And so, uh, you know, hopefully during this show, uh, which is actually quite a long one, uh, we've got quite a long interview with, uh, with Derek and Neil. I think you'll agree, Mr. Whittaker, it was, uh, it's, it, it's one of those interviews where we basically kind of, um, let them go with it and they're going to interject every so often. Yeah. And try and bring Excellent. Them back on tra- yeah, 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 try and bring them back on track. <laughs> stop, stop the bickering. Stop the bickering and say, excuse me, can you please answer the question we originally answered as opposed to the one that you want to answer? Yes. But that, that said, um, it's an, it's an excellent interview and, and there's a lot of good stuff in it. Indeed. A couple of great guys. And so hopefully you will enjoy these next couple of hours as we chat with, uh, Neil and Derek. I must get through to Sergeant Watson's position. Jenkins, cover me. Sir. Sergeant Watson, bring your men in. Withdraw. Oh, it's all right, sir. We're enjoying ourselves. What? Yes, sir. It's these here chain of command rules, sir. We're having great fun. Chain of command? That's right, sir. It's a challenging but fun blend of command and control. It gives me the freedom I want to fight the way I want to. Never had so much fun, sir. But we've cooked you some sausages. Can't be helped, sir. Me and the lads are staying put. Chain of command, World War II, platoon level rules from two fat lardies. They really put you in control. And they're even better than sausages. We're really pleased to welcome back to the show uh, Neil Fawcett from Spartan Games. Hi, Neil. Hey, Neil. Um, How are you doing? I'm, I'm well, mate. Good to have you back. And um, and we spoke briefly at Salute, but uh, also Derek Sinclair from uh, from Spartan. Hi, Derek. Hello, chaps. Good to see you all again. It's 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 good to speak to you again. I mean, as I say, last time we got together, it was oh, salute, wasn't it? 
Yes, it was. We were busy. Um, we were busy stressing over getting the table set up, and uh, you and your team came over and we did a, a very brief interview. Um, when I, I made a lot of visual cues, I should have probably not done that, considering it was a podcast. But okay, this time I'm definitely not going to point at the table and tell you to look at the table. <laughs> I like it. Uh, basically, um, we're recording this on the 10th of July, which is ooh, 10 days before launch of Halo Fleet Battles. Just managed to grab you just before Neil flies out to the States. Um, by the time you hear this, uh, uh, Halo is hopefully going to be available. So, well, it better uh, be, otherwise I'll be coming back from America. Sorry? It said it better be, otherwise I'll be flying back. <laughs> So that, that's that's the hope. Obviously, we've spoken to Neil before, and we've spoken to Derek uh, uh, on a couple of occasion. Uh, uh, on a couple of occasions, Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're the main rules designer for Halo, aren't you? Yeah, well, myself and a chap called Crean, we wrote the rules, but uh, you know, it's very much a team job when we do rules writing. So I suppose yes, the, we wrote the concept, and then you know everybody's filled in the gaps for us. The idea of having you guys on is just to kind of find out as much as we possibly can, because obviously. Whilst we, it, it was very nice to draw all over the bottles at Salute, we, it, you know, we just didn't have time in the day to kind of talk <laughs> in depth about the game and in depth about not only what's coming out but what's coming next, and uh, you know, pump you through as much information about Halo Fleet Battles and anything else that's happening uh, from Spartan, uh, you know, as, as much as possible. Which is kind of the idea of the uh, 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 the idea of the chat we're having now. So, uh, so you know, hopefully um, you'll be as effusive as ever. <laughs> Don't use big words. It's we're all very tired. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, we'll talk as much as we can. Yeah, please talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 question one then, guys. If I turn up on launch day with a large quantity of money and burning a hole in my pocket, what can I actually buy? Uh, we'll send you a box. What's in the box? Lots of stuff. Um, let's see, see if I can remember. There, there are two fleets, Covenant UNSC. There's 49 models. Uh, there are two commander cards. There's 30 dice, 2d6, 128-page full-color rule book, a campaign book, tokens and templates. Actually, no, no, sorry, no templates, just tokens. Um, there is um, punch-out scenery. There's commander cards. There is statistic cards, reference cards. What have I missed? Oh, lots and lots of flight stands. There's oodles of flight stands and something stupid like 144 flight pair. Um, have I missed anything, Derek? Yeah, you and missed the overlays that go onto the flight stands so that people don't I need to stand. Was that, yeah, yeah they, we've, we've got, we built the thing called the, um, the multi-point flight stand, which is this new, new um, uh, stand architecture that we've done for, for, for mounting it, um, flying models on, aerial models. And it's something that we've been working on for a little while, and it basically it's our way of allowing us to do formations of of craft on on a base. So we've designed the base, custom pegs, custom design. It takes the overlays on top, and it allows us to um, basically represent squadrons. Although we don't use the term squadron in Halo, but but we um, elements as we call them, um, which are basically one or one or more ships on a base, and then Derek then recreated the rules that then took those elements, put them into battle groups, and effectively fleet. So the answer to your question is there's lots of stuff in the box. When we spoke at Salute, you said, OK, we're getting 49 models in the box, and I turned around and went, how on earth are you managing to do that? Because there's not many starter sets that turn around and go, OK, well, OK, we're giving you 49 ships. No, well, when I when I when I sort of started the um, the idea of the game, we we obviously got into dialogue. Me, me and Derek talked a lot about it. We talked to Microsoft extensively about it, and we said, you know, what are we going to build? And and, the, and what we wanted to build, and what they wanted us to build, was was a fleet game. So first and foremost, it's not a a skirmish game. It's not um, it's not a nodgy little game where you play with a couple of models. It is literally if you want to play with a fleet, and by fleet I mean start at 49 but then work you if you want to put a couple of hundred models aside on the table we're not the people that stop you and and halo is all about big fleet battles it's all about lots and lots of ships and lots and lots of expandability and so i said today we've got to build a game that allows us to to do that so that was the first big challenge i gave derek was you know build me a mechanic that allows my crazy vision of lots of games to go on the table oh and by the way it's got to appeal to war gamers. It's also got to appeal to non-war gamers. So you know, no, no pressure. 
<laughs> I didn't feel the pressure, but now that you mentioned it, damn, I should have felt a lot of pressure. That, that's a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting though because the the way that the the way that we we approached it was the idea of it feeling very very <laughs> imagery focused. It needed to people needed to be smacked in the face when they see this amount of models on the table. Yeah. So we had to basically have a long discussion about how many models could we get away with, how much could we put down. We had to make sure that everything was imagery focused so that the ships have got to look exactly like they do in the cutscenes or in the gameplay when you're playing a game of Halo. Yeah. So if you're watching a cutscene, you go to the YouTube, you watch a cutscene, you play the game, you watch a cutscene. We have to make sure that what you see there is what you get on our tabletop. So, you know, the, the guys who built the models did an absolutely astonishing job in representing the models in plastic. And it's only when you hold them in your hand that you really get the full import of how clever these guys have been. Um, and so when it came to the game's design, we knew that we had these little areas, 25 dot matrix upon which that we could mount models. And so we started to think about how to represent that in much bigger games. So we build this premise of a battle group. Now, Ordinarily, in a lot of spaceship games, you'll get little squadrons that will combine into making a fleet. Well, our one is little squadrons, or which we call elements, that combine into battle groups. These battle groups then form into a much, much larger fleet. So when you're on the table and we were doing testing, as Neil was talking about, the amount of models you got on the board, we'd be playing games with 200, I suppose, if you can, we count back in terms of some some element bases have multiple elements on them, multiple models on them. Well, we were playing with about 350 to 400 models wow. each side, although the UNSC usually had considerably more, if I'm honest. That, but we were playing with that on an 8x4 or 6x4 table so that we could get as many toys on the table as we could and check and test and, and play the game out. But Derek stresses everybody out that we expected people to play with that many models. I mean, it'd be great if they did, but it, it, <laughs> we did it We did it to see how far we could Take yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. People have to understand that whenever you do beta testing or play testing of games, you always take your game to the, literally the nth level, as, as, far, as far as you can possibly go. Yeah, to try and break it as much as you can, yeah? Well, yeah, the idea is, I mean, we're playing games with 25, uh, 25 Epoch carriers on the table um, because we wanted to see what happens when you put 25 Epoch carriers on the table because the game it's permits it. <laughs> uh, and you have a lot of aircraft you have a lot of um, fighter wings and bomber wings and interceptors tearing each other apart and it was it's fabulous fun um, and it's a complete smash of a game um, but you know you need a lot of space for that does it actually scale to that level without getting just oh, yeah, bogged down absolutely. in absolutely Excellent. it's no problem it's because the turnover of models is very quick because in a fleet game you don't want the minutiae of crunching through micro damage and micro effect you want how much damage does it do is it still alive? Yes. Okay, how much more damage can it take? That much more. Right, okay, now to keep my turn now. You've hit me, I'm going to hit you. And so you want that sort of, you want to feel like you're trading punches across the table in a big epic small, style. Smaller squadron game is where we are with Firestorm. That's what Firestorm Armada does very well. And that and that's what that delivers. But this, this had to deliver something different to that. It had to be, uh, you know, a, a huge big game. And we were, we were looking at things like, uh, well, one of the things that drove us was when Microsoft came back and said, you know, we, we'd really like this game to be set at Reach because it's such a pivotal moment in, in, in the Halo universe, kind of looking forward and looking backwards. They said, you know, we'd like to build, you know, we want to build it around this big battle around Reach. And they said, and also, you know, you guys are going to get to work with us to define what that battle was. And so, you know, we're sat there looking at these lists of ships. There's just, there's just gazillions of the ships there. And it's like, oh my God, we've got to build a game that, you know that where literally people just need to be able to smash each other, pulverize each other, but still, but but not end up sitting there going, oh, well, you know, okay, I've, I've got rid of six bases of ships, but that's a game over for me now. It had to be a very different beast, and um, so that's what. So there's, Derek... a, there's there's an interesting point uh, part of the um, Halo offsite where we were watching all the cutscenes, and you know, terrible. You know, we're doing that. We're, we're having to sit there and play games of Halo as part of our research and inverted commas. <laughs> and so, of course, we're playing there and we're watching... Uh, the that was desperately hard to do. Oh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> really, really stressful. I told my wife how much stress I was under. I'll tell you um, and she, she nodded her head and called me a liar. But, uh, but there's a part... In, we were playing the off-site and there's a wonderful cutscene in the digitally remastered um, Halo 2, I think it is, where they have this digital heads-up display comes up and the Covenant are appearing and everybody's got to scatter to action stations in the UNSC. And you get this immediate graphic that flashes up and it tells you that there's 
277 Paris class frigates engaging against the Covenant force of 360 SDV heavy corvettes, along with all the other elements. And we stopped it there and stood in front of the, the OHP and said, right, that's what we've got to give them. Because that was in a cutscene. People expect to be able to do that. So we've got to make sure that sorry. didn't happen. Uh, uh, OHP, do you think we're in the 1980s? Sorry, well, what is it then? It was an overhead projector, wasn't it? It was a thingy. Well, no, I, I, I don't do a, tech. What is it then? Well, it was, a, it was a very nice, you know, high definition projector. Thank you very much, because I bought it for Halo. So <laughs> it was an overhead projector then, was it? <laughs> I don't know projectors. <laughs> don't make so me yeah, Google it, Neil. Time. I'll go and Google it now and find out if it's called an OHP. I'm not going back in time to talk to you again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, OHP, if I'm back at school. Well, I'm can we move get... on? I've got to put another log on the fire and paint the wall soon. So <laughs> with my hand and the finger paints. <laughs> so these, these masses of ship models, do you actually start from the... 3D models from the game, or what? No, it's uh, the, the the assets are very very different to to what we built because um, video games producers they 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 get to um, they they're making their models for a radically different um, uh, medium. So what we do is we we take the 3D um, assets. We had some we had access to some wonderful models uh, that were done by Player Studios, and and so we had um, some tremendous assets. And what we did is we take that as a starting point to ensure that we're accurate in terms of dimensions and measurements and everything scaling next to each other and basically we then literally take that into a three into a, and build a 3d object on that to make sure it's accurate um but at, uh, but at, um, at kind of a high resolution ver- not a high resolution version it's probably a simpler way of putting it and then we then have to deconstruct that into parts to put it into the plastic so it was a it's a very lengthy process but we were, you know, we were very, very pleased with with, with the effects. Because obviously, you know, the, some of the detail level that, that you see on the ships and the video games are nothing more than just bit maps that have been made in something like Photoshop. Whereas the physicality of what we do is it has to exist in in in, in real. So it's uh, if it's you know we have to build it all. It's literally, my boys started from scratch with it. Um, used their reference materials, and then away we away we went. And then, of course, that was the time at which Microsoft said to us, "And by the way, you you get to create some ships for us." <laughs> and that was a bit where well, you could have knocked my lads off the seat because you know they got they they were allowed to actually build spaceships for Hill, and that was you know, that was just incredible, really, for them. Oh yeah, I mean uh, yeah, I, I, as you say, because the law is so much bigger than what you. The, than what you see in in, in, in all the cutscenes, isn't it? So, yeah, and there, there's so it's, much more talked about that you just never see. It's immense. It's just it, it's truly immense. We've been incredibly fortunate to become um, part of that and to actually be allowed to participate in in the three four three creation of this. And um, I mean, they, they've been um, they've been wonderful to us, really, in terms of being very they've been very understanding of a little company in Somerset. And uh, you know, we've worked pretty hard um, to come up with what we think is a, it's a very good quality product. And um, no, no, they it it it's it, it's immense. It truly it's truly, and it's just getting bigger. I mean, their plans are monumental for what they have they planned for Halo. And of course, you know, from our point of view, we you know, we're utterly delighted to be part of that. So, what scale are we looking at here? I mean, you know, you know, as far, as far as actual models are concerned, what sort of scale are we looking at? At about one twenty thousand scale compared to that. I mean, they, they, the Microsoft guys supplied us with a wonderful um, a spreadsheet at the beginning of the project where uh, Derek and I we could take a look at a model. We could tap in. We could tap in a measurement and say, okay, if we wanted it on a table this long, what scale would it be? And we we ended up settling for one twenty thousand scale because. The, the the model that set the scale for the game is the Covenant Assault Carrier because it's that um, it's a beautiful model and that was the model that we decided we wanted to have on the tabletop in the game. It's about twenty nine centimeters long. I was um, say that's a big ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a big ship. It's about and, and and that was the one that basically everything rolled backwards from that. And what happened because the, the original set of models, which I think you actually saw some of those when you came to my office, yeah. um, they were slightly larger, and then but then. That was the point at which we, 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 we looked at the carrier and it was the carrier was going to end up being thirty seven centimetres long and it was like that's no, just it's a bit it's just a bit much a big ask 
to ask people to, to game that as much as they might want to. It, it, you know, it's a bit, it's a big chunk, and we were we were looking at other models, so we thought, well, the, you know, if the Paris class frigate is sort of kind of the smallest, and the Covenant assault carrier is sort of kind of the biggest, what scale works for that? And we landed on one twenty thousand scale, and we're, we're delighted with it because it allows us to do all sorts of fun stuff like Mac platforms and. We're just in the process of, um, of finishing off the designs now on a thing called the UNSC Trafalgar class, which is the super carry, which has never been seen before. So we, we were very excited that Microsoft let us go go ahead and design the super carry for the UNSC. So that's fantastic. Um, and there's there's a whole bunch of other new stuff that that, that we're working with them on. And so now it, it's, um, yeah, 120,000 ago. The assault ca- Covenant Assault Carrier is 29 centimetres long. Yep. How big does that make a, a, the Paris class? The Paris class is about 25, 28 mil, I think. Um, I haven't got one in front of me. I'm pretty sure it's of that ilk. It's of that ilk. And because of its size, because it's out of that as a frigate, that, that was the thing where we started looking at um, the multiple basing architecture. So the Paris, you, know, you, you don't see them on their own. You see them in formation. So Derek came up with the idea that we'd have things like trident formations and arrowhead formations. And then we've got line formations and oblique formations. So you have multiple ships on the bases. And then, of course, within the bases, you have this concept of supported ships. So you can also then take the smaller ships and support the bigger ships, like the carriers. You can have Paris-class frigates supporting them, or you can have UNSC Halber-class destroyers. Um, and then we've just created a new um, escort vessel for the Covenant. So you'll have the new Covenant escorts to go along with things like the STV heavy corvettes. And then, of course, there's several other corvettes designs so that was it so the whole idea is that, you, is that you've got more on the small model they're very multi-base they're very multi-model to the base because they're fighting in formations which is what gives them the strength on the table as opposed to you know one singular ship trying to take on a gigantic 29 centimeter assault carrier you, you certainly get this this visual representation of what the, you know whether it's a carrier battle group or, or, or what have you that's yeah. all there and, and obviously hence the reason why you've had to design these new bases so you can get all these different formations in place absolutely i mean if you so, look at so exactly how do they work then i mean i mean do you have like um different size pegs that you can attach your ships to or or what how, exactly how does that that whole formation thing work yeah well the thing about the formations is the base itself has a 25 dot matrix on it which we can put multiple models into um, okay, depending so how, on how so, those are so manifest quickly, on so we can uh, so, so we can visualize it exactly how big is this base it's a 60 That's by 60 base what 60 by 60 okay Thank you. so that allows us to manifest lots of different formations and that sort of thing um into the onto the base and then the different pictographic representation of those whether in an arrow or whether they're in a v-shape for a trident or in a line if they're the covenant how that's pictographically represented will be the, um, the the difference between what the stats are. So you can look at the formation base and then know what your stats are because it's visually, you'll know that's in an arrowhead formation or a trident. And then you plug your ships into that 25-dot matrix based upon the overlay that we give you, and that will have your little stats on it as well to speed up your gameplay as well. So that as you move that 60-by-60 60 60 base, you're also able to um, manifest and see your stats immediately. Well, that's fine. You, basically, you, 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 if you kind of uh, imagine the, kind of the, the three frigates, they're acting as a squadron. So you've you got the um, the squadron would take an overlay, and then on that is the arcs of fire, which represent the arcs of fire of the arrowhead formation. So you're not fighting individual ships on that. You're actually fighting the formation. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the start in the starter set, you've got what's so you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there's 27 Paris class frigates in the box. I think. And how big's a frigate? Uh, 28 mil. Yeah, oh, about that. Frigates. Yeah, frigates. Yeah. 28 mil, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, about that. Yeah, about the prox- approximately that. Um, and so, and they're on the base. And then um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to um, remember the exact size. I, I can't, I'm going to have to follow up and email you that one actually and send, send you the dimensions over. But yes, but as Derek said, the, the flight stand overlays then kind of allow you to represent the formations on the table, and it also means that um, what you can do is, is uh, it, by by plugging in different formations into different styles, you're then putting different ships on with the different 
other different ships to support them. You you you, you have a multitude of of bases and designs and and units that can fight. You're not just restricted to you know one. So you, let's say you've got an EPOC carrier. You can have it fighting on its own. You can have it fighting with um, um, uh, Paris class frigates. You can have it fighting with um, Halberd um, destroyers, and then you can have it fighting with some of the new stuff that's coming out. Um, we haven't quite uh, we haven't got a base where we've added a cruiser to because that would be a bit much. But uh, there would potentially nothing. To be, there could be nothing to stop us doing things like that. But that suddenly starts adding an awful lot of firepower, so you have to be careful not to imbalance again. Um, although Derek has got a particularly vicious UNSC one that has got two marathon clusters. Yeah, that's my favourite. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit. It's, it's I don't like that one. Cause it's a bit. It's 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 filth on the table. That's nasty. It, it is absolutely monstrous. But you can you don't get very many of them. And to be perfectly honest, it's primary target number one to anybody who's played against them. You think, oh, I'm it's having that. Yeah, it's because the covenant weapons magnet. It's quite. It's quite funny how fast you go and kill that. <laughs> anyway, so. Yeah. I suppose in, in some ways, sort of talking about the formations and everything, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we're kind of getting uh, getting ahead of ourselves just a, uh, uh, just a little bit. Let's take one step backwards. Obviously, knowing the uh, the law of reach, and you know, looking back, and okay, what happened? Yeah. Um, and it, uh, it's a conversation we've kind of had in the past to kind of say, well, some people will, but essentially, ask the question. Why are we looking? Yeah, you know, why are we looking at battle round reach when basically the you know the USNC got its ass handed it yeah you know, it handed to itself and, and and the Covenant wiped the floor. So how do you go go about producing a balanced game where at that point the Covenant was so technically superior to the USNC? It depends how you want to play it. Really. I mean, you, you, you can you can play it in, in full in, in if you want to do a scenario mode that kind of represent that represents that battle. Then uh, it, you you know yes, of course the the UNSC player is going to get um, booted around the table. Um, it, I mean, they were they were outnumbered and technologically that the, the Covenant ships are better. But it's, it's at the end of the day, it's a game. So it, if you want to go as far as to just completely represent it in full on cannon mode, then the, then whoever plays the UNSC has to learn to lose um, and he has to learn that space that'll be part of, his, of the process for that player um, but who, nobody, nobody builds a game where you just want to all lose nobody wants to play that so obviously there's a you know there's a challenge in itself behind that and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, isn't there you've got twice as many well you've almost got twice as many twice as many UNSC ships um, in of Covenant I mean so from so one of the balancing points and that was that you have you know you've got larger formations and stuff I mean the UNSC player is going to lose ships there's you're not they're not going to play a game and not lose ships and the analogy that Derek came up with um, which we talked to Microsoft about quite a while ago was the was the, the analogy of the, of the pack and the bear and the Covenant are the bear and 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 the, the UNSC are the hounds, the pack that are trying to take the bear down. And of course, in order to do that, you tend, you're going to take casualties. Um, so, you know, the, the UNSC player has to be um, understanding of the fact that he's going to get a smack on the teeth because the, the Covenant ships are nasty. They are, I mean, there's, there, there are certain weapon systems on them that if you get too close, they're just going to pulverize you. And so you just have to play. You you got to play very tactically with them, and, and and kind of make sure that you don't give the give the covenant player the opportunity to 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 bosh you about too much. You've got and you you've got to try and get the advantage of having multiple activations over them. You need more battle groups than them. Hence the reason you've got more models, and that's where the game comes into its own. But I think it's it, it's a difficult one because you are you are correct in in that the storyline is you've got basically the that it's it's the last stand. It's the humans are getting hammered. Um, the it's rock drift, it. isn't it? Well, it, yeah, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty much it's, it's that kind it's of value. It's Asa- guys against Martini Henry rifles. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, it's it's sort of like um, I, we we jokingly used to say that with the with the UNSC, you, it's like you're going to lose, but it's how well you lose. <laughs> going to lose with uh, but you know it, it, you don't you're not always going to lose because because if you play a points balance game, then you've got a chance of checking them out. You know, you're not you, we haven't built a game where that's one sided that the Covenant player is just going to smack you about all the time. You know. Uh, but you can't get a scenario where you know you are going to get smacked about, but that's if that's for the play, that's for the fan that wants to play those asymmetrical games. 
Um, and, and, and there's plenty of options to do that. And there are plenty of options to play, you know, parity driven games whereby you, you can, you know, you both field a thousand points and away you go and have a great, have a great amount of fun and just kill each other. I mean, Derek might have an input on that one because obviously that was one of the challenges that, that, that yeah, he got that was, that was the first thing we came across because obviously we started, as I said, from an imagery and canning point of view and you're correct, quite correct. The uh, UNSC get a drubbing at reach and there's no way around mm-hmm. it. But that's not to say they got a drubbing at every moment of every instant of every part of the battle. There can be little snapshots happening where, you know, a certain number of battle groups that fought in reach did a heroic action and allowed more civilians to get off the planet as a result. They sacrificed themselves. They flew in, took out a capital ship or a number of capital ships. And that can be represented in a mini scenario as well. So whilst it is true that, yes, I mean, if you're playing asymmetrically, the the Covenant are going to win. And that doesn't really make for a long-term war game because both sides will eventually get bored of that. You have to, we had to view it from the moment of taking a snapshot or take the battlefield as a whole and then look at a snapshot and little moments in time. And you're playing with the fleets and ships that were available in that little snapshot. And there is just as much chance within that snapshot of the UNSC winning as the Covenant. Of course, the Covenant man for man or creature for man have, have advantages. But then, as Neil pointed out, the hounds and the bear, if that bear swings its claw too slowly, then the hounds can get round the back. Sure, one of the hounds will get clubbed and killed. Then then that leaves the neck open for two other hounds to go in. Um, and it's, you know, there's a certain amount of noble heroic sacrifice that circulates around the humans in the, the canon. And it, it does kind also, of fit that point of view. Let's not forget Spartans. You know, and I don't mean you know, I mean Spartans. As in, you know, that we got them built in the game. Boarding actions are a big part of this game. Yes, you oh, know, okay. there are certain visual identities that, that we had to kind of that we had to embrace on this one. You know, we needed the fighters and the bombers and that kind of swarming mass of of destruction before the battle. Um, you know, we had to represent the big battle, but we also had to represent you know the idea of zealots and Spartans. Boarding ships, taking ships, planting bombs, blowing things up, and, and you know we had to kind of we had to model certain tactics uh, that the UNSC had about um, about overloading the shield systems and that, and the and the defence arrays of the Covenant ships, so they could hit, um, so they could pulverise them with the with the Max and then hit them with the missiles or vice versa and things like that. And it's just there was a whole a whole mishmash of that sort of stuff that we had to build in. So it's 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 it is a um, it's a fascinating um, world to start reading into because, of course, an awful lot of that stuff you don't, you know, as a, as video games plays, we don't we don't necessarily see that it exists. But of course, it all exists in written format. And we had these, yeah. we had, the, we had this, we had a wonderful chap, Kenneth, at Microsoft, who was basically he was our man. He was our Jiminy Cricket. He kept us completely true and on and on target with this. There sounds so much to kind of. You know, get your head around and actually get in the game. Uh, you know, especially when you kind of uh, what, on the one hand you're saying, okay, we're talking about a fleet battle, but at the same time, the same rules have to be able to handle boarding actions. Yeah. Um, down to you know, <laughs> uh, almost individual ship level, if you like. So, okay, how do you go about doing that, and how does it all work? How does it all fit together? Before we get back to that one, sorry, I'm just going to jump back to your last question. The other thing about Reach as well is that, it, you know, you, you, when you pick a point in time in a game like this, it's the beauty of picking Reach is that we're, we're, we're kind of slap bang in the middle because it is a pivotal moment and it is an important moment. And it was, the, and it, but before that was 30 years of wars or thereabouts. And then going forward, you've got a relatively short amount of time heading into the Halo 4 era. But, um, you know, it's, I think uh, I'm trying to remember exactly off the top of my head, but it's about five years, I think. But anyway, and I'm sure that the fans of Halo will correct me on that time period. But so you've got, with, this, with these models that we've built, you've, you're not just that reach. You've got all of the actions in the outer colonies that you can fight in a 20-odd year period of time with all of those ships. Um, you know, and, and so you've got a lot of actions that 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 will come out. You know, Sigma Town. You've got all of these all these battles that that use the same tech, that use the same ships, that were smaller engagements that might have only been twenty or thirty or forty ships aside or ten ships aside. You know, um, that you can play um, reaches the it reaches the big cataclysmic event, and then of course looking forward and beyond this, you know, we got all of that. We got all the really sexy stuff like Infinity. 
going backwards, we've got stuff like Spirit of Fire. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of that. And, of course, let's not forget Halo 5 and beyond. And, of course, within that, you, within the realms of that, you've got all sorts of stuff happening. And then in the Halo 4 time frame, you had the Covenant turning up on the co- turning on the Covenant. So you've got kind of in-wars there. Uh, with the UNSC, you've got all of the naval fleet, naval war game stuff that you can do. So you can literally play the whole red versus blue and have UNSC flight, fleet, fleets fighting UNSC fleets. Because there's the there's the whole there's a whole idea of what of the of the war game simulator mode. So yeah, you know, there's a there's um there's a lot there and of course it's 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 not just about reach. Reach is just um a focal point for want of a better expression. It's a very good focal point and it's perfect place to have it's also a place to kick the ground game into. Um but of course, you know, you've got up and down the food chain for want of a better expression and or up and down the timeline. Anyway, back to your question about boarding, over to Derek, sorry. <laughs> well, 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 basically, I'm just about boring. It, it's about okay. So, given that huge framework that you've got to work, you know, that, uh, uh, that huge scope that you have to work with, uh, you yeah. know, how do you make it all work? So, yeah, how does the game work, basically? Well, okay, right. Um, well, the thing about boarding of course, is <laughs> the thing about boarding is that. Um, you're quite right. It's a it's a micro effect on what is essentially a massively macro game, and so what was important was that when we do boarding actions, that the game doesn't stop. So in the in the end of our attacks phase, you're allowed to essentially shoot or launch your boarding craft at an enemy ship, but you don't resolve the boarding at that point. That ship is still free to fly about and do as much damage as it likes. It's assumed that while it's ha- that's happening you're fighting through a couple of levels of Halo with your UNSC Marines or your Spartan or your Zealots or your Grunts, and they are tearing each other apart on the ship. And then at some point, one side will get the upper hand and then damage will be affected on that ship. And so we have a boarding table where there's various different types of damage. Let's not forget, you can also launch supporting freight. You can also um, counter Well, this this is what I was going to get to. Because the boarding's done at the end of the, the game turn, it means that if I if it looks like it's pretty clear my tactics are to take out your large ship by saturating you with boarding craft, you can launch some boarding craft of your own to try and relieve that ship uh, in an effort to try and um, protect the ship from damage. This becomes very important for the UNSC because the UNSC tend to pick a ship that they want dead and they make it dead by sending Spartans and, and, and Marines aboard to do as much damage as it can um, it's very likely that they'll get vulnerable markers out of that damage, and vulnerable markers will affect the ship's ability to defend itself with um, against missiles, and its defense arrays will go down. That Couple that with the max overloading people's shields, and so you have an in-game mechanic. So the boarding is, it's not an end effect, it's a, it's a mesh within the game itself. Um, but to get that to work in the macro effect means that it has to happen at the end of the game turn. So players have got to be a bit canny and try and think about a, le- a game turn ahead what sort of damage will I get in the boarding phase? Am I overloading him? Do I have enough? I should have enough people on board. Or do I have a Spartan? You know, Spartans do a lot of the work themselves. And uh, and that will be that will be the way that it represents on the tabletop. So it's, it is a micro effect, but it's a micro effect that everybody has a frame of reference for because we've all played the video games. And in the video games, you are that person on that boarding ship. You know, a lot of the levels are done on Covenant vessels or on UNSC vessels in space. So... That's why it was so important to have it. And that little micro effect has a massive effect within macro if it's played properly. Okay, so that's quite an in-depth look at one bit of it. Um, If we can take it one step backwards and say, right, okay, we've got our battle groups. We've put that together. You've got ways of deciding uh, how you're going to play your game, whether it's a points-based battle or whether it's a scenario battle. Kind of making an assumption here that that's that would be the usual two ways of playing. Pretty much, I think you know you can kind of there's a very nice um, scenario system in the book that allows you to basically roll a kind of random sort of shoot off a random set of scenarios before you either play the game, but or you can um, follow up. Over time, imagine over time there'll be um, you know reach books that will or rather Halo books that will come out with more missions and things in them. So, and I mean, very much the first the first set of missions that are in the campaign book that come in the two-player box are 
very much about a chap called Ro Baratumi and Ro Bar- um, sorry Barutami. So um, Ro is the supreme commander of the of the Covenant fleet. He, he has um, uh, he's the guy who headed up with the fleet. He arrived on Long Night of Solace. Uh, which is a gigantic carrier. Um, so, but Rose, Rose had a um, uh, he he was on a mission uh, prior to to the to Reach. Anyway, to to some extent, for Rose, Reach was almost a um, a byproduct of his of his mission to look for fallen artifacts. So we've we've built in a set of scenarios that's very much about um, Rose and his crew and his and his. Um, it's patrol fleet, so I'm basically um, looking for foreign technology in, in the Reach system, uh, in the Eridani system, as I said before, the battle. Um, so, so, again, because those scenarios are not just about um, the, the UNSC playing getting mullered on the planet, they're about, you know, the kind of the effects of, of what happened um, in the kind of the weeks leading up to Reach, uh, which to some extent is one of those, is one of the storylines that people may understand from the novels and things but they pay, they may well have not have encountered in, in the Reach game itself because the Reach game is very much about the planet and the battle and the destruction and, and all about Noble Team whereas um, you know what we what we've took you know we've we, we've worked at Microsoft to understand what was happening in the weeks prior to that and what his fleet was doing so those scenarios are you know, they, they range from full on conflicts to you know half a dozen ship type of scenarios where you know one of them you know it seems like the UNSC play may well be a case of him, of him getting off the table and surviving it might just, it might not necessarily be a scenario that's about him winning and killing they, you know, he may well win by actually escaping it there's a, there's a number of scenarios like that and that's that's very much about creating that 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 kind of feel for the whole campaign and the narrative but again, you know, it, it's very it's very simple for say, you know, Derek and I to turn up at a table, roll off on the table, and tell them to find out that we're playing an ambush scenario or an annihilation scenario, or pick another name for a scenario. Derek, my brain's gone blank. Uh, meeting engagement, flank attacks, mm-hmm. planetary yeah, assault and, missions. And we, you know, we and we basically take, say, okay, we're going to play with a thousand points each, and we're going to play with, you know, um, with. And the things, and we take our points, and we we have, you know, I'll have um, Vice Admiral Stanforth if I'm playing the UNSC, and um, Derek will be uh, Rule Barutami. Um, I always keep saying his name wrong, and then basically off we pop, and away we can just roll up and just muller each other, or we can you like to go through the campaign setting. There's the middle um, ground you can do as well, which we've done before, if you remember, as we we rolled three scenarios, and then we had a discussion between us as to which scenario we think would be most suited to be the first scenario and then we make an agreement which would be if I win the scenario that's the one I want to play if you win that's the one we want we'll play and so you can almost yeah. you sort of tree diagram a little campaign for yourself based upon a narrative that you decide as a game I think and it's, it's going to be very easy to watch the fans because you know it, the thing is the beauty of what we were building is you know the, this, the, the Hilly universe is, 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 is magnificent and huge and there's a lot going on and I think Fans of the fans of the game will actually well, they'll start doing their own thing. They'll start um, you know generating their own campaigns and scenarios. And we and we're we're getting very excited about the idea of what we'll be of being able to see people do that. You know we're going to very actively encourage that for folk to come and show us and tell us what they're doing because you know you know we we've just created the framework. Really, it's up to it's all about the fun that people will have with it now. That's the beauty of it. Um, and you know we, we we can't wait to see what three four three do because they're, they're all uh, they're, they're, get, they're getting their bottles very shortly so they'll be off they'll be off and running and playing. There's there's over five hundred guys at three four three. You know <laughs> there's a whole there's a whole there's a whole, there's a whole league of Halo there. That's going to be a seriously so. busy canteen, isn't it? You know that they're <laughs> playing their lunch break their games at a canteen. Well, yeah. A couple, a couple of the guys that we've been working with have taken it very seriously, so I'll be, I'll be fascinated to see what their fleets look like. They'll <laughs> <laughs> be, be like, I've like, oh, I've got more, I've got more heavy cruisers than you." <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll be like this. I'll be like Kenneth will take a big hammer to Rick's models. It'd be quite funny. Or change, um, but no, it, <laughs> I'll, I'll change, change the, the cannons. Story so so why not? <laughs> Rewrite it to win. No, um, it's pretty cool like that one, actually. Um, we're very excited, as you can tell, like children. Yeah. Actually, I, think, I, mean, I was talking about the fleet admirals. Yeah, that's a big part. Let's not forget the, the admirals is a big part. We had um, when we had our offside. You know, that was that, re- that when we had that really hard five days in a cottage where we just played Halo <laughs> yeah. and, and drank. Um, 
it was um, we, we one of the things that we we, we came we were discussing the the impact. If you think about Halo, it's it's you've got these these incredible um, characters um, and 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 you know heroes and villains and you know good guys, bad guys, and and um, these these commanders and uh, who and, and it's capturing that in the game was very important. So we came up with sort of um, well, Derek, Derek came up with this idea of the, of the command dice system whereby. These characters have got a card, and on that card are their orders. That they are, there are certain generic orders that any fleet admiral can play, but there are also certain characteristics and specialities that these guys are good at. You know, sort of certain ones are good at boarding or tactics, or, or you know, sort of um, outguessing the opponent or upsetting the opponent. And um, we we got this engine whereby you can start changing the feel of the game by introducing different. Um, Different characteristics through different commanders, and uh, and then of course heroes. So it's it's fair to say that down the line you you could easily see a fleet commander. Although I think Master Chief would probably be will probably save him for the ground game. But you could you could potentially have um, let's say um, Jacob Keys, who's the um, commander of the um, Pillar of Autumn. You can imagine him as a fleet as a fleet commander in it potentially with. Cortana as a has a as a hero card, a, a, what we call a heroic character, and the meshing together of these characters giving special abilities. Because if you think about the um, the autumn class, uh, well, you know you've got you've got the the Halcyon cruiser, which was the pillar of autumn, which then effectively became the autumn class cruiser. But you've got this um, you've got this ship that's really cool, but you can't you can't make it um, invincible. You certainly can't have it killing, you know, just kind of rolling up to an assault carrier and just destroying it because it just is unfeasible whereas if you start giving these commanders the ability to you know save the ship or get it out of the way or take it out of harm's way or, or just kind of use their abilities and skill set and interacting the, the character with the fleet commander to, to, to make effects in the game happen you, you're not just breaking the game by making these games super powerful you know it's a bit like when you have a game whereby you know my character doesn't die because well he's a hero of course he can't die he just he's invincible you can't have that there's not nonsense you know people with your main heroes in this game they die but if you attach people with them they can stay alive and, and they can influence those around them like in the ground game spartan them just i'm not jumping into a new game but the spartans are very much about influencing what goes on around them as opposed to just running around killing things well that's what Derek, that's what Derek told me anyway no, that, that's certainly what we're going for. I mean, the, obviously, because they because they are what they are, you know, a byproduct of them being there is that stuff dies. Um, but uh, the nature of Spartans, both in the, the the fleet battles game and in the ground game, will be as a facilitator of death. One way or another, having them on the table will make it more likely for you to do accelerated levels of damage. That, that's a hell of a job title, isn't it? A facilitator of death. Facilitator of death. It sounds like they should be writing speeches or something, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I like it. Yeah, 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 I think you should take that and frame that. I think that's on Master Chief's <laughs> business card. My name is yeah. <laughs> it's John One One Seven. I'm a facilitator of death. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I believe that motto is actually on Derek's underwear, but that can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a big fat ass, so there's probably enough space for it. And on no, that think... bombshell, right? <laughs> so what we're talking about? Oh, fleet characters, yeah, yes. Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So, right. Okay. So we've got fleet commanders that have special actions. Yeah, that's, that's uh, so... yeah we're really proud. We're really, we're very, very pleased with that mechanic. It's fluid. It's simple, and it's massively expandable for the characters. Uh, but you know, but but the idea is to make none of them, it, none of them, none of them can can, uh, can break a game. And, and a combination of them can influence a game, but none of them can break the game. That's the critical thing. You know, right. there was there was nothing in the game that could be so powerful that it would break anything. I um, mean, it's a bit like with fighters and bombers. You know, we you know that we you can have an awful lot of them, but they, you, they, you've almost got to be. If you think about video games, sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm going off on one here, but very fairly moment, but. It's it's sort of it's an instant gratification. Video games have got have got this instant feedback. It's like oh look, I pull the trigger, something just died on the screen. Yeah. War games war games don't necessarily deliver that. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the time, sometimes you can be you can be kind of building up to that bit where you're grinding away and grinding, and then suddenly your opponent is forced collapses. And there's a, there was a danger that we could if we built a game that was too too much about um, attrition 
that it would be it wouldn't appeal to uh, to to a set of, of customers. So we had to kind of say, okay, you know, we, we we need to look at a way of of making stuff die, but not die in a way that ruins again. But also giving things like um, fighters and bombers and wings, the wings of them as we call them, the ability for people to just literally smash each other apart. Plus, Derek and I have got a, a kind of a um, a, a very a, an exciting little module that expands on the way that fighters and wings are, are, are play in the game, which because we, we that's a new thing that's coming out for the game, which is very very exciting. But we can't really say much more about that, but other than the fact that it's it's very ex, you know, massively extensive and it's huge for fun. But you've got this bit where we're letting people kill stuff. That there, there, there's this churn of death, <laughs> oh, uh, constantly happening. And of course, then you then you're kind of brutalising each other with the elements, and you're you're killing you. Know, it's like you know, Derek waits in with an ORS heavy cruiser, and he decides to hit me with the plasma lance as opposed to the um, it is the lance, isn't it? Derek, the close. I always get the names wrong. Yeah, the close. Uh... Yeah, yeah, the, no, the, the, the lance. No, yeah. The lance, yeah. So he sweeps across my three Paris class frigates with his lance, and, he, and because of the way the, the weapon operates, is he decimates, you know, my three elements potentially, and then uh, and I'm, pl- I'm plucking off nine frigates. <laughs> you know, yeah. I haven't lost a frigate. I've lost three squad. I've lost. I've effectively lost three squadrons. You know, three three elements of them. And it's like, you know, you know that hurt. You know, then so then I have to kind of pile in with my. You know, my marathons and my frigates, and then kind of hit him with the max, and then hit him with the salvo with the missiles, and kind of try and get my arm back. And it's that sort of um, brutal tit for tat that you know I'm kind of slap you in the face, you slap me in the face a little bit, and and make sure that there's this gratification of death each turn. Yeah. You know, as opposed to you know we've played six turns and now you collapse. Um, it, that it couldn't be that it had to be a much more giving game. <laughs> <laughs> had to give more death. <laughs> yes. There had to be more destruction so people feel like they both had a good time. <laughs> um. <laughs> so once you start playing a scenario, so how does things like um, initiative, turn sequence, and all that sort of stuff work? That's all facilitated by the commanders. Um, you know, the, com- the way that you roll your command dice will decide, will determine whether or not you have an advantage or a disadvantage in determining initiative. Then you nominate one of your battle groups and you go with your battle group. Then I get a go with my battle group and then you get a go with your battle group and then we alternate as we, as we play. Um, and that alternating activation mechanic is, is kind of seems to be coming a bit of a, a wargaming staple now. Everybody really likes the alternating activation mechanic because everybody's in the game. Nobody's waiting for their turn. Everybody's in the game at one point or you have less time to wait for your turn. I think it's fair to say. And so um, the, the turn sequence starts with your, your commanders and they are issuing orders to your fleet. They're trying to bring damage squadrons that were perhaps a little bit below strength into a more cohesive whole by calling an order called Form Up. And that allows you to take stragglers from formations that have inevitably, you know, you, you suffer lots of casualties in the game. And you might be sitting there with a, two Paris frigates here and a marathon cruiser over there. And you think, God, they would be really good if I could put them together. Well, this order allows you to bring them into a formation to do that. Because oh, that's quite unusual because um, most games actually don't let you do that, do they? Because it's one of those things of, well, each, each individual battle group, is uh, you know it's its own own path in itself, and therefore you know, you don't make um, battle groups on the fly. You know that battle group is is only on its own, and you know can't do anything else other than get to the point where it's degraded and it's going to. Yeah, I mean, if you think about a Second World War game, for example, you might lose X amount of men from one squad, X amount of men from another. Um, and then, you know, they're standing right next to each other and nobody thinks to maybe move in together and amalgamate. That happens quite a lot in wargaming. You get to that point of, um, well, it's redundancy is what I called it when we were specking the game out. But you get that point where you think, well, this guy's not good enough to do anything now. Whereas if he was, if he was joined up with a couple of other people, he wouldn't be. He wouldn't be redundant. And so that was something that we wanted to do because we people who are new to wargaming might not be used to that concept of maybe just trying to retire that model um, because it's not worth it anymore. You know, if you've got a victory point system and you've got a unit that's only worth X amount of points if they're all dead and you've got one model left, then, you know, you sometimes try and run away with that model to save yourself the victory points. But in the, the canon of Halo, that doesn't really suit. You've got the 
you've got the crusading um, covenant who are out to destroy as many humans as they possibly can. And then they've got the humans fighting a last ditch battle of survival where they realize that they are the last line before it's civilians getting murdered by the covenant. So, you know, these people are not inclined to make a retreat move. These people are inclined to get into the fight again and hit harder than they were hit themselves. And so that's why the, right. the form up order is such an important part of the game, I think. Um, and it's been able to marshal that and, and do play game, um, with battle groups that are behind your lines. And they're deliberately done that way so that they can release some of their um, charges from their battle group to go prop up units that are maybe taking hits in the line. You don't, you don't just advance in a slow, steady sweep. You've got to have little pocket battle groups that are there to reinforce as, as casualties come in. And that's a very important tactic, when, especially when you start to play larger games, because casualties in larger games are just as inevitable as anywhere else. But having the right firepower at the right place at the right time requires tactics and skill and strategy from the commanders. And that's where the commander dice come in, because to be able to issue that order, you need to have rolled a specific result on the on the dice. Right. But those that specific result is determinant. If you use it for a form-up order, you're not able to use it in initiative in other places. So there's a real sense of drama in these order dice that um, is something that I'm really pleased with, because drama in war games is what where it's at. And if we've got Halo, and, and Halo is as dramatic a setting as you can possibly imagine, you know, it's literally humanity's on a knife edge throughout the whole of the genre uh, of games, then, yeah. you know, we wanted to have drama in our games and the, the commanders allow for that. It's, it's, it's worth saying at this point as well, so that you, there, there is no real concept of army lists either. You, you're... It's a it's a free building mechanic by where you take your forces and build them how you want to build them. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we didn't want to didn't want to do you know a squadron of X Y Z, and um, you must put them in this amount this sort of thing. We wanted it to be like a fleet battles game would be, um, you know, a genuine fleet battles game. I remember the very first war game I ever played was a game called Trafalgar, and all that you did was yeah. put ships down on a table and then you formed your groups based upon where they were. How you'd placed them decided how your um, your fleet interacted. And and I thought, oh, that was that was that's very similar to what we've got here. That people should feel free and it should be fluid. It should be a fluid system before you play and as you play. So you do have to work towards a certain um, build rating. You know, you can't have you can't have twenty five ships all in one battle group. No, um, no. All of them being ORS um, battle cruisers or something. But you can uh, CCS battlecruisers, but you can have um, you can have a certain amount of people in a formation, but what you choose is up to you. So yeah, I think it's. And I mean, there will, of course, with certain scenarios, be be lists up that we offer. We always say that this battle group is composed of these vessels. How we uh, sorry, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, flotillas or whatever you want to call them. It, it, it may, we may well say here is your list of six ships. How you form them will be up to you, but it, so, so you may well, you, you may well be technically presented with you know, an amount of equipment, but then as to as to how you want to play around with those, it's entirely up to you. You know, sort of there are, we have this concept of of um, actually I keep forgetting the name, but it's, it's basically you've got normal battle groups or proper battle groups and the standard battle groups, sorry, and then you've also got um, specialized battle groups. Yeah. And they're the ones that they kind of slightly break the rules, or they actually some of them break the rules a lot. But you're limited as to how many of those you can have. So, so and this is the idea being is that for every sort of standard battle group, you can have a quasi broken battle group that kind of can reflect some of the tactics and marshalling of troops and things that you've had. So, things uh, like I'm trying to think of anything, like the UNSC, they've got a one called the. The one with the frigates, the Paris class frigates, Derek, is it um Gorgon? No. Sorry, the the, the Par- just the Paris class frigates yeah. is the Harpy Battle Group. Hap- the Harpy Battle Group, yeah, Harpy Class Battle yeah, the Harpy Battle Group. And basically it's it's six bases of, of um Paris class frigates. So eighteen Paris class frigates. <laughs> and that is the the very it's, it's it's a nasty little battle group. So you can you, you don't you can't have many of those, but you can have one actually. You can, um, because, uh, unless the scenario says you're allowed more than one. But you know, um, in yeah, general play, so that we can keep a degree of balance, we've we've said a maximum of one, and yeah, it's conditional uh, with you having a normal standard battle group as well. 
Yeah, and uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, when, when you when you get your rules, you'll figure all of that out. But it's it's very very easy. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I mean, I, I take it from uh, the, the way you talk, you, you're talking about these dice. Uh, these are uh, specialist dice for the game, as opposed to your standard D six or one. Yeah, well, we so we we basically, um, you know, we we love our exploding D six mechanic. It's a great engine. It it works for our games. We absolutely. Um, you know, we, 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 we just love gaming it. It's great because it can throw some wonderfully volatile moments. Um, whereas, but what we wanted to be able to do with Halo is, is um, to some extent, um, you ha- we had to sort of dedicate to sort of circumvent the um, the apocalyptic craziness that can occur with a D6 roll. Because if you, with, the, with, the, with the current engine that we have, you can keep rolling and you can keep going. And if you get really, really lucky, you can go mega lucky. And that's great fun. And, yeah. and I personally love that because it's that idea that, you know, I've kind of like, I've I've rolled up, I've got the lucky shot, I've managed to waste the shell in between the two, you know, bits of steel on your ship and you've gone kaboom. It sometimes doesn't sit comfortably with everybody. So Derek went away and looked at it and, and looked at it and he thought, well, he needed to look at a way of, of capping that so he needed the excitement of the exploding dice, but he needed a, he needed a capping mechanic, and and also a way by which he could um, throttle back the probability curve, so that when we were modelling the Halo ships, we weren't breaking them too much in relation to what Microsoft expected them to do inside Halo. Right. So, do you want to talk about your new dice, Derek? <laughs> okay. Well, you've done a good job so far. Uh, Essentially, we we have a we, we still use a six sided dice, um, and that dice has um, four symbols that exist on those dice. There's a skull symbol, which is bad. There's two miss symbols, which are bad but not as bad as skulls. There's a hit symbol, and then there's an, what we would still call an explosive hit symbol. And um, because because everybody's got a really good Spartan game story about the time that they rolled explosive dice, and um, we wanted to keep it as as Neil says, but we wanted to be able to mess with the probability curve and the way that the statistics work for D6s. So it might sound a bit ridiculous, but by taking two options out, we actually become, we're able to flatten out the statistics curve. There's only four results that you can get on our six-sided dice now. Um, and so by rolling them, you, you move up and down something called a firepower rating, and that will tell you how your reroll effects come into play. So there might be situations whereby you're allowed to re-roll, but you can only re-roll misses um, rather than skulls. So if you see skulls and the speed at which we're looking people to play the game, if you know that you're on a specific rating and you see skulls, just get rid of them. You're never going to see them again for this turn. Um, that shot didn't won't, won't work with those skulls. Um, and then it can move up and down the ratings. The statistics and the probability is very, very simple. And it, what it means is that a gamer who's perhaps new to Spartan Games mechanics or somebody who wants to restrict themselves statistically can actually look at it and, and justifiably predict closer what they think their, their hits will be. And that means that people have got a little bit more control. And control is important if they're coming to a war game cold. They've never played a game before. Um, you know, there might be video gamers out there that want to play, um, play this as, as a, as the game, the, the tabletop game. And it shouldn't, they shouldn't have to deal with that level of mathematics to start with. So that's why the Halo system is more pictographic. It's it's not counting dots. It's you know looking at the dice and finding a, a symbol on a dice and saying, right, that's got a one on it. Okay, that means that's one hit. Oh, that's got a two on it. Oh, that means it's two hits. And do I get a special result? Let's check the firepower rating and see. And that's essentially how the dice system works. It's it's difficult to explain verbally. Um, but when you see the the rules written down, and and when you play it one time, you'll it, because it's visual, it'll click in people's heads. No doubt about it. It's really easy to follow it. Are we boring him yet, Derek? Sure. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't want to go into the, the multiples and tell them all the statistics of what result each are. But I'm, I'm holding that <laughs> in reserve in case I feel like this conversation has gone crazy. I'm, I'm the one. Who, I'm the one who writes blog posts on probability for war gamers. So excellent. <laughs> like this, 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 this may mean I have to buy the rules. Oops! Oh, darn right you will. <laughs> when, it's when, you, it's when you hear the silence in the background, that suddenly there's a gun shot. It's like, <laughs> oh, like uh, we went too far. Oh, 
no, 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 no. I've, do, I've done the stats for chain of command activation rolls. Nothing's harder than that. So, yeah, so that's the dice. So, yeah, again, simplified on the dice mechanic. Really good fun. Visually strong. Works in with a new visual um, um, command dice with the icons on. So, yeah, pretty, you know, pretty good stuff. Okay. So, it's alternate unit, alternate unit activation. Yeah. And by the sound of things, uh, um, each battle group, uh, on each activation, you, you go through a number of phases. Right, yeah? Yeah. And segments and actions and actions. Yeah. So it's all structured in, in, in the way that you would expect any war game to have with different different moments in time where mechanics would activate. Um, and you have your orders. Then you take your, um, your movement section for that, that battle group. And uh, the movement section is very simple. We, in a lot of our games, like Dystopian Wars or Planet Fall or Firestorm Armada, we do um, we have turning templates. But in a massed fleet game that we're talking about, we decided that we didn't really need it. And um, we'll just allow people visually by eye to turn up to 45 degrees. Because the, every movement element's a square, it's actually really easy to... to, to to see what a 45 degree turn would be. So your first step, you, you turn your model, then you perform any movement that you want to do, and then if your model's capable of doing so, it can perform a second step. Now, geometrically, that's important because you get much wider curves than you would in any of our other games, and that's kind of a condition of, of the way Halo is. Halo is, if you want to think of it, it's very much like a Spanish galleon. All the ships move in stately curves. Nothing turns tight. So we to be able to, to do that turning mechanic gives us a nice wide curve of movement, which you know encourages broadside combats where the ships are circling each other. You know, it's very difficult to turn into a, a curve once it's been broken. So, you know, you must maybe have to find a new target if someone outmaneuvers you. So that very simple forty five degree turning mechanic gives lots and lots of tactics and movement that perhaps weren't initially um we didn't actually didn't actually see the tactics until we started to play it a lot, and then thought, "Oh, this is great!" Um, and it was an interesting part of the build, actually, is, is the the movement phase because it seems incredibly simple, and it is. It's designed to be simple, but the tactics yeah. ha- execute within that movement after over three or four turns, and that's where the skill will come in. And a good Halo gamer will start to just seem to have guns to bear on battle groups within optimum range in turn three and four, whereas somebody who's new to the game is struggling. Why aren't my max in arc? Why aren't my max in arc? He says, well, you know, you've been outmaneuvered by the Covenant. And that shouldn't happen because the Covenant are slower than the UNSC, but a good Covenant player can use the terrain on the battlefield and, you know, luring targets <laughs> into somebody's view to get exactly what they need, which is to get their big ships into range. And when that happens, oh dear, the UNSC are going to have a bad hair day. Surprising how many times that glide rule saves them as well, Derek, actually. To get oh yes, up. yeah, because the Covenant don't have to turn. They can just move laterally if they want to. Um because that's kind of part of their canon. These ships are, are quite manoeuvrable. They're not fast, but they're very manoeuvrable, so they can move laterally. And, of course, the UNSC, if, if the UNSC player is a clever player, he's thought a turn ahead about where he thinks an enemy battle group will be. If he doesn't perform a turning action, he can move a lot faster because he just hits the hard burn of the, um, the advanced engines that they've got and move faster. So if he thinks that he's got an opportunity to pounce like the Hound, then he can take it by hitting his hard burn. So these are two loadouts that these two fleets have that, that typify their battle tactics. The thing with the, the thing with movement is movement had to be fast and simple and fluid because once you start getting a lot of toys on the table, you, you, we, it couldn't bog it down. So it had to be the sort of thing whereby it was an instant agreement. Two players could just do it and they can get on with it. You're moving your forces, you're lining them up, you're shooting them because... You know, you, you want to keep that friendly banter going. You don't want something be, somebody being really anal about measuring it to the nth degree. You want it to be able, somebody to be able to just you know point it. They agree that it was an M45. They move it. They maybe tilt it another up to 45. And then they're done, and they can move on to the next part of the force. So they can kind of get that fluid movement between the two of them pretty quickly. You know, that was what that was what it was yeah. all about. I mean, you know, we could have gone as stupidly granular as we as we wanted, and but we decided to not do that. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, you look at something like uh, what Fantasy Flight did with um, the, their Star Wars fleet game, and you've got these, and, and you've got these, you know, these really intricate measuring tools uh, for movement. 
that's fine and works and works okay if you've only got you know uh, half a dozen big models per slide on the table. When, uh, as you say, when you've potentially got a couple of hundred models on the table, you're running out of room, aren't you? It's um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there is a particular practicality that you have to be aware of. When you're doing all this. You, you make a choice of what sort of game you're building, and you know, uh, again, you know, without, without sounding like a broken record, we built a fleet game. And if you're going to if you're going to tell people you're building a fleet game, build a fleet game. You know, I mean, Five Star Armada is a is a, is a fleet game, but it's more of a patrol fleet, smaller, like, sort of more of a skirmish style spaceship game. You know, this is this is a fleet game. I mean, I I, I, I actually sound I'm, that's my little mantra, I suppose, that, that I kind of talk when when I talk to the guys at the office about that because it is a it's a beast. It is a different beast to this. It is that sort of size of thing. It's like you know you you're not if you want to play. Um, three or four spaceships and call it a fleet, then I'll be frankly honest with you, Halo Fleet Battles is not the game for you. You know, but if you want to play mass battle action, then that then bring it on, that we're your game, you know? But you, you just know that somebody's gonna try and take about eight box sets on a twelve by six and see how just see how whether they can break your rules. Because um, it always happens. Well, I ho- I certainly hope they do, because that's what we do for play playtesting. Well, absolutely, and, and and you know, good luck to them because they'll 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 enjoy it. They'll have a bloody good laugh doing it, and at the end of it, they'll kind of go, "Let's do it again." I, I, I'll I, you know, I'll guarantee it because it's 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 that sort of game, and I think it's uh, from um, you know we we um, we've got some um, cool plans coming up for for things like that and um, and stuff that we're going to sort of share with it with the customers and 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 and. Um, you know, we're 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 hugely looking forward to seeing the picture. That can, you know, I, I can't wait to see the first set of pictures that come up of somebody doing that. You know, because uh, it just it, it gives me it gives me a huge buzz to see that sort of stuff. And I think, um, you know, we we you know we 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 tend to if we want a quick bash at the office, we tend to you know we, we tend to put at least a box set each down and, and we just go for it. Um, you know, and that's when we kind of want to go on a, want a good poke at each other. But you know, when we want, when we're, when we, if we've got more of an afternoon free, we we put more on there. We tend to break my snooker table up and kind of go for it because you know, that's a good size thing to put a lot, and you can get a hell of a lot of shit on there. <laughs> so, so um, it's a big snooker. So, so, so here's a question then: that that typical game with a box set each, or I assume um, one of you takes all the USC bits, etc. How long does that take, and how big a table? That's different. four I mean, by I mean, four and no more than an hour and ten hour and ten ten minutes for setup and an hour for slapping each other about and I said um, yeah four by four will we'll, we'll get you into combat nice and quick if you move that to six by four you'll start having a lot more flanking fun with each other exactly and I'm not going to say so that, in, in that way go four by four in that way, it's sort of doing the same thing that Planetfall does in that you can move it out onto a bigger table and have more scope for manoeuvre and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, they're, they're, two com- they're two different games, but they, they approach the, the, the premise in the same way as that you can play small on a small table. It's perfectly acceptable to play on a dining, a dining room table if, if you wanted to. Um, and then as people get more and more models, you know, obviously, the, the game is designed to, to naturally extend the table. You just get bigger. Well, it, and bigger. It, yeah, I mean, to give you an idea, we've been uh, we've been playing a lot of games with the new aerial models, uh, and we te- we tend to gravitate to a six before because it's really good fun to be able to kind of tear ass across the table with our with our aerial stuff, um, upsetting each other on the flanks and kind of coming across. So that's that sort of. Um, but again, you know that if we were just doing the ground stuff, then we you know we'd be having a fun of four before five be five. Um, but as soon as you start one, I mean, it just. The thing, it's the best part is as long as you don't expect people to have to have a six by four, you've got to be able to like you know legislate for the smaller size for them if they want. Um, equally, some of the guys in the office um, play in the lunchtime on a three by three because they want to just have a get a few models down, batter each other, and then get back to work. Um, you know, because I've been the hard taskmaster that I am, I don't give them much time for lunch. You know, kind of gotta, gotta crack the whip. And um, but but again, you know, like like with, like with the planet four thing, you know, with the six before you you you've got that kind of openness to a bit more space, a bit more maneuverability, a bit more tactics coming. It's good, it's good fun, you know. Um, but I mean, I you know we've um, I, I I've got up some boards that we had made, which I think you played on Neil, um, which are, which tend to be sort of seven by five. You know, we find that 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 with this with the seven by five, you can easily get two to three starter sets each. 
you know, so basically, effectively, you know, kind of a hundred. Well, like in, the, in the case of the UNSC, around about a hundred odd ships, and it is just it's a beautiful size for that. It just it just it plays a great game, and you you'll kind of batter each other in an hour, an hour and a quarter. But again, you know, it, it, we're used to the rules, so we flip through it pretty quick, you know. But you know, when you kind of that wonderful thing about wargaming, where we where we we actually like the crack a bit, and we've got our mates around, so we're talking bollocks half the time that we're rolling dice. So the, so, yeah, so the game can, you know, if you want to pad it out to a couple of hours and talk nonsense and have a couple of beers, then, you know, then it, it'll, it'll be that sort of game as well. But if you're really into it and you're fast flowing with it, you can crunch it out pretty quick because once you get the, the, the rules condensed down on the four sides of A5 on the reference sheet and then really, to be honest with you, they're off and running. <laughs> so you've got uh, movement, uh, you've got orders, you've got movement. Tell us about combat. How, um, how does combat work? Uh, what sort of, I mean, things like, Firing. you know, what Firing. sort of ranges are we looking at? Well, you, we don't do the fighters first, I think, because we've still got the yeah, fighters yeah. and bombers yeah, to do, yeah. and that's, that's an important part of the game. Um, yeah, that's, so, yeah, and, and, and things like, I'm mean, obviously, you know, in a, uh, in a game where, a, uh, where a, uh, a frigate is 28 mil, um, it, you know, fighters are minuscule, aren't they? They are, they're tokens. I mean, they're, they're tiny. I mean, you've got things like an epoch carrier. I mean, you know, a Covenant assault carrier is about nine kilometres long, I think. So fighters are just um, diddy little boys. Um, and also there's lots of them. So they're represented as um, stackable tokens. We have what we call a wing. Um, I tell you, Derek, talk about wings. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, what wings are is they're, they're a collection of bombers or interceptors that are clustered together and we, we manifest them as a token due to their size. They'd be so small, it'd be impossible for us to make a model for them without misrepresenting them in terms of scale on the table. So, And these wings are deployed by the ships that you choose and each ship of its certain type will, will be presented with hangars and those hangars can usually contain one flight token. When you've taken your battle group, all the, the, the hangars that you have get added together, they become flight tokens and then you decide what types of flight token you want to put down. Do you want interceptors down to protect you against um, bombers? Or do you want bombers to take the battle to the enemy and give them a good drubbing? And then how you how you build them, exactly like we, we talked about with the battle groups, what you choose to put down is entirely up to you. You might decide, no, I'm going to put down bombers. I'm just going to go totally bombers and make the Covenant player deal with me. Or you might decide to be a bit more canny, a couple of small interceptor wings to pinch um, wing uh, enemy uh, uh, interceptors and allow your bombers to get through. There's lots and lots of tactics. We have um, tactics for locking and unlocking um, bomber wings and fighter wings. I don't want to get too much into that because that will take us a while. Um, but the the whole point about the the wings phase is it's it's pretty bloody. <laughs> Things die a lot, um, but they're an important part of the game. They're absolutely critical in the canon and the fluff. You can actually play some levels in the the video games where you're you're actually taking part in, in the various different dogfights and attack runs um, that we manifest. So we had to make sure it was there. And in the cutscenes, there's a particularly that cutscene that I was talking about earlier, the, you see this um, heads-up display with all the different types of ships showing up, but there's this, what look like two swarms coming towards each other um, in front of those ships, and those things are your wings. And so we had to represent that, and we want to get that fighting before you're fighting because there will be maneuver and you will maybe not get as many shots in the first early turns but you can be sure your fighters and bombers will be tearing chunks out of each other and uh, you know if the bombers get through then small ships like frigates and heavy corvettes are very susceptible to bombing runs because they don't have a lot of point defense to shoot these bombers out the sky so those bombers will get in and put cheap damage down on the, these light ships and by doing that it takes the pressure off your main ships to shoot at them because you'd much rather have your big ships shooting big ships rather than wasting their time shooting a little piddly corvette. Um, you want to be pounding on a big battle cruiser or a, a, a heavy carrier um, if you've got the option. And so the, using the wings tactically, again, there's lots more tactics involved in stopping your opponent from getting his wings through interceptors. There's quite a lot in wings, actually. It's a, it's a very complicated... Well, it's, it's not a complicated set of rules, but it's a very in-depth bit of tactics involved. I think in the first couple of games, people will... Take it, take a mix, and you know they'll they'll get the immediate tactics that are involved around it. How do I get through? I keep getting stopped by interceptors. Do I need more interceptors? No, that's fine. I'll I'll keep letting him take interceptors because if I don't take any bombers, he'll waste his time. 
And so you can trade off that way. And there's lots, lots of clever trade offs. And if you play against, say, one person a lot or, or a group of people quite often, then you'll start to get used to their tactics and then you can flip it on them and be clever and change your way that you play with the wings. Um, and that's an important part of the game, obviously. It keeps the game fresh because wings is just another way, like commanders and, and choosing your commanders, you can choose your loadout of your wings. That just keeps the game fresh as well. And it takes us ne- neatly on to the attack segment, which happens straight after. Right, okay. So you've you got effectively the, the pre-engagement of the fleets is all the wings and, and, and fight and interceptor combat, and then you get on to, uh, for want of a better phrase... Yes, the big guns landing on your face, essentially, the, the big hitting. Yeah. And that's done through a process of firing solutions. So you nominate battle group, that you, you move your battle group, then you nominate that battle group's firing solutions. And that's essentially all the different ships that you want to shoot in the turn with that ship, with that battle group. And then you resolve each firing solution one after the other. Okay, now this is the sort of thing that's laid out on the templates you were talking about. Yeah? How do you mean? On the, the profile sheets? On the, on the, yeah, sorry, on the, yeah, on the, on, on the profile sheet. Yes, it'll, you, it'll tell you, it'll you tell you what your arc of fire is, what the weapon's got. It'll tell you what loadout it might have. If it's a Mac cannon, for example, it'll tell you what value your Mac cannon is. Um, it'll tell you how many dice you roll and it'll tell you your arc and your range, whether it's short range or long range. And sometimes weapons will have different, um, different rules, whether they're firing at short range or long range. For example, plasma weapons aren't very good at long range, but are devastatingly effective at short range, and that will manifest itself there. Right, okay. Now, does each weapon have a different short and long range, or is that something that's very standard? In the most, in the most part, you'll find that people's, say, plasma arrays all fire at the same range. So it means it's a really easy remembrance step for people. They can look at a glance and say, right, it's a plasma array. Am I within... 10, I'm in within 20, and that makes it nice and easy to, for people to track. And because there's not that many different types of ships in the Halo universe at the moment anyway, it'll be very easy for people to get up to speed. The benefit, of course, is that if you've got the overlay on your, on your, on your element base, you'll actually know already. It'll tell you it's on the overlay. Um, it'll tell you what arcs you've got. It won't tell you how many attack dice you roll, but that's that's why you have the fleet list. But the fleet list can condense onto two sides of A5. So you can just turn your... You, know, you can look at your A5 sheet while you play. Um, so the, really, the, the remembrance of stats should be pretty straightforward for people. Um, for existing wargamers, certainly. And for new players, well, they're, they're a really easy point of reference. And because the game uses simple addition, it doesn't have... And in most of our, our games, we use... Uh, a system called linking fire, where there's a, a, a series of mathematical steps that are required to get yourself a firing solution. In in Halo Fleet Battles, it's just simply a pool system. So you just drag all your dice together in the, as part of a firing solution and you roll it. And because of the way that we talked about with the dice, you're just counting successes. And then you total them. I then roll any defenses I might have. And then the aggregate of what's left, I check against my damage. And we see if I've taken damage. And that's that's the whole of shooting done in a nutshell. It's really straightforward. Um, you get to do multiple types of shooting. There's lots of different weapons and you know plasma beams. You've got plasma lances. You've got plasma torpedoes. You've got Mac cannons. The Archer missile system is very prevalent. All these weapons manifest in the game, and they all execute within their own firing solutions depending on their type. Right. Okay. Now, thing, things like missiles and and perhaps drones and various other bits and pieces. Uh, if you go back into the old days of things like um, good old days of Starfleet battles and that sort of stuff, where you used to, um, uh, other than fighters, uh, fighter wings flying around, you used to have uh, it, you know, missiles used to take a finite amount of time to actually arrive at their target and and, uh, and stuff like this. Is that a sort of thing that happens, uh, or is it a case of pretty much as far as... Um, uh, combat is concerned uh, all your weaponry is pretty much instantaneous well we I mean I've, I've have played that the, the Starfleet Battles game a lot and uh, yes that was one of the the things that you know was a lot of data tracking on that wasn't it you had to and, and yeah. it was it was a game of its time I think but uh, I don't think the modern war gamer would support um, doing that so we we looked at the instantaneous effects in itself, although of course with plasma torpedoes and, and archer missiles, 
um, you do get an opportunity to shoot them out of the sky with a point defence system um, because it's assumed that they have a degree of predictable track. And so the, the, the target vessel would know, oh, there's some archers coming at me, load up the PD guns and get them firing, and they just blank it and try and take out as many of the, the missiles as they can before the impact. So whilst it is instantaneous, there is a, a granular degree of protection, added protection that every ship will get in the form of its point defence systems. Right, OK. And, and also, obviously, they're, as you say, they're effective depending on the weapon system that's right. deployed yep. against you. Oh, that sounds really cool. You're saying that essentially uh, it's quite a bloody game as far as, you know, there's, uh, there's an awful lot of damage flying around each turn. Um, so I take it that, uh, you know, as far as the damage that is being dealt with and, you know, what particular ships can take, uh, you know, uh, you're usually expecting to be, uh, you know, inflicting a lot of damage. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And because the game is a, a bloody system, you know, the, the Halo universe is, you know, it doesn't pull no punches. It's very, very hardcore blood on the, the amount of um, amount of damage that you do. I mean, Master Chief works his way through quite a lot of grunts per level in, in any of the missions that he fights. So you know, you think, well, you know, we had to make sure it was nice and quick and nice and fluid. And you will know, you, you will expect to do damage but the important thing about halo is that there's only four tokens in the game um because you don't need any more there's damage there's activated there's um vulnerable and there's the countdown marker and that's really all you need so it means okay. that when it comes down to it it's very quick so whilst you will be taking damage you know if i'm playing a game of halo fleet battles and i'm up against somebody if it's their turn to shoot me i've actually got the damage counters in my hand because I know something's coming. I'm taking damage, no matter what happens. Um, and it's okay, the damage is down, and it's how much damage does I take? Now, normally, ships can, uh, vessels can only take about three points of damage, and they're bust. But the level of damage, the level of successes that's required to hit that damage is dependent on what type of ship it is. So, obviously, a little frigate a squad, a little frigate element, that's not going to take nearly as much damage as, say, an Epoch carrier will. Um, and then so the, there'll be tipping points within that. So maybe the epoch carrier takes a lot to take it, take off the first point of damage, and then it has a, a, a slow drop off after that. Um, whereas something like a big heavy covenant vessel, that one has perhaps a more sus- persistent damage. So it might have eight, eight, five or something. Whereas an epoch might have nine, oh, right. four, three, something like that. Right, so the damage factors work in in a similar sort of way to what we like. Yeah, you know, if you're familiar with say Planet for Worlds, mm. for example, uh, and the, and the way the damage works on uh, the uh, uh, the helixes in in, in that uh, damage works in a particular way. Where okay, uh, for each particular damage point, you have to inflict a certain number of successes before you get. That That's right. So it's what we call a soak system in the the way that you build it right. you you can soak up to x amount of damage and then from that point you take damage um there's one of the reasons i like the the variable number system is because in, in a lot of um traditional war games that are out there at the moment you, you maybe have a toughness stat and you have a wound stat and you can take x amount of hits before it hits your toughness and then if you do you take a wound now that's yeah. fine but it presupposes that the person who turned up to the battlefield in the morning is just as combat capable as with, with his full amount of wounds as that he was when he has only one wound remaining, um, and that seems a bit ridiculous. You no, know, I've, I've chopped off two of his arms, but he's just he's just as tough as he always was, even with two arms missing. Um, and so I quite like that system whereby you can set different values so that you can see a steady progression as a gamer of a of a vehicle or a vessel falling apart on you. And you know that there's more drama attached to it because that chap could just has to get slightly less hits next time and that ship's going to going to just fall off. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we went with it with Halo. It's another one of those drama decisions. We chose it because it's quite good drama and and people tend to like that sort of thing. Once we've gone through combat and we go through damage, is there a, 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 another phase that we go through or, or is it at that point that you basically... No. Um, what we would do is, we'd, uh, still in the shooting phase, if you do damage, you roll for seeing if you get a critical hit. And then that's the application of vulnerable markers that we've talked about previously. Um, yeah, so, yeah, there was vulnerable... Uh, there were vulnerable and the uh, damage marker and then the countdown marker, which we'll get to in the boarding phase, because it's the only time it ever gets right. used. 
Okay, so what do vulnerable markers do? Well, vulnerable markers are very important. What vulnerable markers do is they take down your effectiveness to defend yourself. So when I was talking about you building an attack pool and me building a defense pool, um, if I'm attacked and I and I would have a defense pool, I would lose a success for every vulnerable marker that I had. So having vulnerable markers is a catastrophe for the Covenant because they rely on their their, their um, defense system arrays to protect themselves from incoming fire. And if the max start to overload the shields, it, it's represented by taking a vulnerable marker. And vulnerable markers are very prevalent in the boarding phase. So if I want a ship dead and I'm the UNSC player, I send my Spartan at it and I make sure he puts a vulnerable marker on, then I'll pound that ship apart. And obviously, the Spartan will try and get off the ship before it turns into a ball of fire. But, you know, you can't make an, om- an omelette without breaking a few eggs, and sometimes you just have to let it ride. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there's plenty more where he came from. Oh, no, wait, there isn't. But, you know, there should have been. <laughs> um, and so that's what we, that's what the vulnerable marker's for. The vulnerable marker is designed to represent that, that um, weakening of a ship's capability to defend itself. Um, and damage markers weaken your ability to inflict damage. So it's a nice, easy remembrance step if you want to think of it that way. And so once that's done, you would move on to the boarding phase, which we've talked about um, previously, but the boarding phase has, um, you know, Master Chief and Zealots tearing each other apart. You, because it's happened at the very, very end of everybody's movement and everybody's shooting, there's a separate phase called the boarding phase. It means that if you've boarded one of my ships, I can try and relieve it by sending my own boarding craft at that ship in an effort to try and get you off my ship, especially if you've sent a Spartan over. Um, I'm just trying to churn, I'm just trying to clog him up with so many grunts that he can't get to the control room and set the bomb. Um, and in the boarding phase, we have the application of these countdown markers. It's one of the um, effects that you get on the boarding table. And once you put a countdown marker on a ship, its days are essentially numbered. It really has It has only got so long. And it, to represent in Halo, and it happens a lot in Halo, is there's a bomb or they overload the ship, or something like that. And it's really the only way for a for a super soldier like a Spartan to blow up a huge monolithic vessel, is to set a bomb, or to have it you know, go into a sun, or something like that. So that's to represent that countdown towards the inevitable demise of a ship. Right. Okay, and, and that's a, a certain number of... A, a certain number exactly of that, yeah. Or... Now, once those countdown markers are in place, can they actually be? You know, can they? Yes, God, you're there? second guessing everything here. Yes, in the end phase, that is exactly what that's about. So you imagine that there's two grunts licking their um, top lip and say to themselves, "Should I cut the blue wire or the red wire?" And the other grunt <laughs> says, "I don't know. We're both colorblind. How do you know what wire we're supposed to cut?" He said, "I'll cut them both," and and then that is the the act of repair. You know, I'm sure the Covenant have got much better scientists than two grunts, but uh, you know the analogy is there. And so you would you would sit there and you, you try and make a repair roll, and if you roll badly, you'll add markers. Uh, if you roll well, you'll take markers away. If a, ve- a vessel ever gets to six markers, it explodes in what's called a catastrophic critical core breach, and everybody around it suffers as a result and, <laughs> and suffers bad. I was going to say, and obviously depending on the size of the ship, I would Yes, imagine. so a small ship, like say an, if an SDV frigate went up, yeah, that wouldn't be too bad. Everybody around a bit would probably take about eight or nine dice worth of attacks. If a very big ship goes up, and that's one of the reasons why as the UNSC player, I like to try and board big ships in an effort to try and get this result. If a big ship goes up, then yes, you can probably take everything that's off, uh, everything that's within about eight inches off, because it's probably going to get pummeled by this huge ship just catastrophically blowing up and taking out a good section of the fleet um, and that's part of the gameplay so that's what that's what makes boarding such an important part of it because you do, when you're playing a, the Halo computer game uh, you never really get to see the ramifications of what happens when you blow up a battle cruiser or you blow up a, a frigate uh, a corvette but in the Halo fleet battles, yes, you will get to see it taking out, it blowing up and then the wreckage scattering and smashing into other ships of both sides. Um, but again, you know, I'm a pretty brutal UNSC player. You can't make an omelette, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if a couple of those guys die, that's all right. Those people, the, the, the Covenant died too. And that's what's most important. 
Um, but you know, that's a try. That's a balancing act, um, and it's one of those exciting moments. You just don't know how well the the, the countdown marker will go. And of course, you can repair your vulnerable markers too, so that's not a permanent effect. And then any um, boarding craft that are adrift, that have been adrift in space, so if a ship blew up or if they weren't able to reach their target, they can try and get back to a mothership, in which case they can launch again. And from that moment, you're at the point whereby you check your victory conditions and you turn back to the start and start rolling your fleet orders again, uh, rolling your fleet dice and starting again. Right. So there's a lot in it. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, I know you've been stressing that. Uh, you know, actually, you know, it's 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 very it's very intuitive. But at the same time, it sounds like uh, you know you're having to cover an awful lot of eventualities within the phases. That yes, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the thing is that um, Halo they they don't muck about. They've got an incredibly broad and incredibly engaging canon. There's a lot there. And and we have to have to represent all of it, and so yes, we need yeah. we need fleet commanders. I mean, Neil talked about the fleet commanders, and one of the things I always see about Halo is that it is a very personalised game. It's the the personalities in it. These characters are are really really well developed. They work very hard to make them feel real or, or plausible, and so we had to we have to make them in a macro game still have to have that micro attachment. We talked about that in boarding with the macro and micro and the, the fleet commanders do that. And then of course we've got the, the ultimate micro in the game, which is the little um, interceptors and bombers trading off. And then we come to the battle fleets and the, the battleships, they're blowing each other apart. And then we go back to micro again, right at the end, which is the boarding phase. And these, there's this interaction between macro and micro means that there's quite a lot to cover. But I think because of the framework, we've, we've probably nailed it, actually. I think it's it's as good as we could have made it. I'm very, very pleased with the the feeling, the, you know, the in and out feeling that we get from it. And, and I'm hopeful that people will enjoy playing through. Oh, well, I, I, it certainly sounds a really cool system. Um I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of itching to play already. <laughs> <laughs> well, the person to ask is Neil, because he'll, he'll send you some freebies. You know, he's, he's a very nice man. Um. <laughs> I'm I'm relying on the fact that uh, AD Down our club is uh, is a sucker for all things Spartan, and by the time I get back from the states, there will be at least one box set sitting at the club. Well, I mean, one of the things that I've I mean, I've just I've got my models, the actual models today. I've, I've had some prototypes and things like that, but these are the ones that you know we'll we'll all be buying. And uh, I'm you know, there's two they're in two separate colours, so the Covenant are in purple. And the units seen are in grey, and that matches the motif going through the the book. There's different types of um, colour motifs, and I suppose if you're being uber lazy, you could just not paint them, and just play with them as purple and grey. I mean, it's, I'm it's still not, going to paint them, but it's you know, not, it's not about being lazy, is it? I mean, it's, there are going to be people playing this game who just the 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 the, the idea of painting models would literally flip them out. Because they, I suppose, they, yeah, I misspeak then. Yeah, it's it's basically from my point of view is I want to paint them. Oh but, yeah, no, uh, from other so, point of view, there will be gamers out there that just feel like they just want to um, enter the universe and play the game. That that's fine. They should feel like they should be able to. I've seen your painting. I just leave them plastic for you, mate. Um, but that's why that's why I play games well, where I can dry brush things. That that that's. And then, <laughs> well, I must admit, I, I, I've been looking at some of the paint jobs you guys have been doing, and I'm thinking, oh, heck, I'm going to have to learn that okay, No, it, it was important. I mean, you know, from a uh, from a, from a standpoint of, you know, the, the, the two audiences that the game's got to appeal to, you know, the, the, the Halo fan and, and the War Game. The War Game all paid it. And that's the beauty of, the, of I mentioned earlier, on the, the idea of the, of the kind of the War Game mode. And the idea being is, you know, in in that mode, it's 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 a free for all. The you know, if somebody wants to come along and paint their fleet pink, okay, they suddenly have a set of pink ships. But you know, sure, it's not canon. It doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. But you know, this is that whole idea that it's a simulator and they do what they want, sort of thing. And of course, you know, people love to 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 basically put their identity on their models, and that's a cool thing. And we again really excited to see what people do with that. I've got my, I've got a. Um, it's really funny when we get we, we had a set of plastics came through which were test ones that came through in black and um, we shipped them off to Microsoft and it was really funny because the, the emails came back where oh my god they look so cool in black <laughs> you 
you know, it's like, okay, I quite fancy a set of Black Covenant ships because they look really good. Um, but of course, you know, they're normally that kind of the purpley blue colour. But you know, but I mean, I, I mean, I've just I've just given a set to um, to a painter who's going to do me a set of covenant in green, a set of covenant in orange, and I've got the red versus blues being painted up for the UNSC. I've got a green set being done for me personally because I want my UNSC in green. Um, you know, it, it, it'd, be, it'd be fun to see what people come up with, and of course, you know, as, as just as future models come out and um, you know new stuff, and it'd be interesting to see what the new paint schemes look like. Um, so no, I. I um, It'll be very amusing, but no, it, we had to do the colours. We, we did that. We chose the plastics in a, a very nice, high quality finish that um, means that if somebody wants to, they can literally pop them out the box, take them off the sprue, glue them together, put them on the base, and they match into the base of the overlay cards are themed to match the colour palette, and the colour palette in itself is also themed to match into um, Wearpoint, which is the Halo cha- uh, the Halo website channel. So, you know, there's an awful lot of continuity and work on into making sure that they all hang together very nicely out of the box. And for a lot of people, it, it needed to be an experience that looked good on the table as is, as opposed to one painting. But what we don't want to do is, is challenge these guys to not want to play the game because they don't feel they can paint them. You know, they they should just enjoy the universe that they love. And that's the, that's a huge part of it. So, and they actually they look great. I mean, the, the the covenant, the purple of the covenant is just because purple is a hard color to get right. You know, it, it, it can either look great or crap. And and I I'm really I'm very very pleased with the color scheme that came. I mean, to ask, ask Derek, he's a cynical Scotsman. You like? Uh, I'm absolutely, you like the color of the covenant? I'm absolutely delighted. I mean, you know. Neil's really big on colours. He, he likes that. It's the ex-journalist in him. He likes all those things. For me, I'm looking at the way the models, the shape of the models, how how do I build them, those sorts of things. And I'm blown away. I think they're fabulous. I stuck together my all the UNSC in about an hour. And, yeah, they're, they're absolutely magic. They really are. And the Covenant, the Covenant just look amazing. The curves on them, the rounds... I could, the, the way they fit in my hand, I know I'm going to be able to paint them, if, um, and I'm just, I'm just really pleased. Yeah. yeah, well, the curves are one thing. I tell you, it was the detail level we have to get. We have to get Microsoft wanted to angry. <laughs> I've made a lot of tool makers very, very unhappy lately. <laughs> so it's and probably very rich. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Funny, funny that. Yeah. These are not inexpensive tools. I will be honest with you; they are top end, without a doubt. And they are, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks, mate. You just reminds me how poor I am. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, it's a transient state. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> wait, it's going to get worse. Yeah. Wait, it's going to get worse. Thanks. <laughs> well, cheer up. You have got the game franchise for one of the most popular sci-fi universes on the planet. Uh, this is true. I uh, know. I mean, uh, I, I, uh, we are very um, upset. <laughs> I, I'd be blessed. pinching myself most mornings, I think. Well, I don't really want to know about your strange habits. However, <laughs> uh, I, I have to say, yeah, you know, it was a, it was a shock. Um, it was, it was, we winged it. We, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we had a go and. Fortunately for us, our reputation as a company and our games and our models that went before it uh, impressed them. They, they, the guys over there were familiar with us. Um, it appears that a number of the software developers over there played Dystopian Wars. Um, so that was kind of um, uh, gratifying. And I think, no, it, it, I think it's um, we, we've been given an opportunity here of something exciting and very and important for us to do and to do right, you know, that's the important thing with us. We have to, you know, we were, and I sound like a broken gramophone, I sound a bit I don't mean to sound as punchy as I sound when I say this, but it's it, it's you know, we, we, we have a we have a duty now to 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 do the best we can for that community because it's a very, very strong community of people who you know have got behind Halo over the last fifteen years. And of course from a Microsoft point of view for the next fifteen years. And it, it, it's sort of it, it, the pressure. I, I have to say that the, uh, the, at the beginning of it, I, I didn't really. Th- I was so shocked by having got the business that it didn't really um, hammer home. And I think the first time I talked to you guys, I was still in that sort of um, mode of, "Oh my god, we got Halo! Did I tell you we got Halo? Well, we got Halo! Wow, we got Halo! Hey, you know, we got Halo!" <laughs> it's like, 
and and it was it was just trying to work out that it was real. As it, as you kind of get more and more into the project, you you realise that it's in, it's 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 serious stuff. You know, it, it, it's you know, I, mean, I know it's a video game. It's not you know, it's not like saving lives, but it, but it's it's serious stuff. And and there's an awful lot of very professional people there working on it. You know, building it and owning it and creating it and extending it. And um, you know, you, you're working alongside these folks, and they've all, they've all got fantastic ideas. And you, you to be to to be to enter into um, an arena whereby you're actually treated like equals in the dialogue with them, and you're allowed to actually. Well, you know, put out ideas and have conversations and plan and plan with them. It's it's wonderfully respectful, and that is a, that's a fantastic um, feeling for a company like 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 mine that's a, still a small business to to actually to, to be given that opportunity. So no, we are we are lucky, and I do pinch myself a lot, uh, not in a weird way. I'd like to Which point that out. Does um, lead to the obvious next question: What's next that you're allowed to tell us about? What have you mean from a Spartan Gears point of view or a Halo point of view? No, I, 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 <laughs> Well, for, um, okay, uh, well, yeah, from a Halo point of view, and, and alongside that, because um, one question I, I was going to ask before I turn around and say, okay, uh, we know what's in the box, what's coming next? Um, the one question I'd like you to answer before we go into that is, obviously, all these models are plastic. Yeah. Now, Spartan are known for doing resin and doing resin wax. Yeah. What's it been like, and what challenges have you faced actually then move, moving over to plastic production for uh, for Halo? Um, well, I, I, the, the the fortunate bit from my point of view is that my designers are very very talented young men who have got an, an awful lot of um, well huge amounts of talent and huge amounts of um, uh, what I what I discovered doing it was maturity in in, in engage, engaging with something like Microsoft to, to do it. So I um, the challenges well. The time scale is interesting because, of course, I'm used to being able to turn on a dime with what I want to do. Um, and I tend to be, my business tends to be restricted by what we can, what we think we can make in terms of volume. So if we build a product, we're sat there going, okay, can we, can we make a thousand of that? Can we make five thousand of that? And, and can we ship it out as opposed to, and that, and so that tends to be what what limits the business in terms of uh, and identifying what my team can and can't manufacture on site. With plastic, of course, you, you're 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 encountering um, a whole new team of perf people. You've got you know you've got the, the tooling company, and we you know we've worked with a fantastic company in England to 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 to, to craft what our precision tools. I mean, these are very very high quality molds. Well, we feel they are. They keep telling us they are. Uh, my accountant keeps telling me they are based on the bills. So the challenge, what's the challenge? Um, well, getting the models right for Microsoft, so the sign-off process to ensure that the models that we uh, we visualize are accurate and that we can then build them in plastic and that they still maintain the aesthetic that can be signed off by Microsoft that they're happy with. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, but again, that's all procedural. So you basically just, you just got to make sure that you approach it in the right way work with the right people and get the right information and the way you go. Um, then you've got the timing issue, which is you've got to kind of you've got to sort of you've got to plot and plan the whole tooling process. And I think we've been at these tools for about twenty six weeks. Um uh, because they are and it, and you know there has been multiple iterations where and of course you know it was a learning curve because these are the first ones that we ever did. So you, you could almost um question the logic of Spartan games that the first plastics it ever did was Halo. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like it's like you know, almost like somebody could have said, "Well, you could have had a practice first, uh, but you know it, it, that that kind of focuses the mind to make sure you do a good job." So, um, and you know, it, I always find it funny when because I've had a couple of people say to me, "You know, it must have been fantastic with Microsoft, you know, kind of putting up all that money to make the tools for you." <laughs> that, would, that would have been tremendous if Microsoft had paid for this. It, it, uh, that would, have been, but uh, you know, obviously, so you've got to fund a big project like this, and you are talking, you know, significant funding. The other big challenge was that we were quite adamant we wanted to do it in England. Um, so it, it was making sure that we could find a partner that we could work with in England and that. 
like uh, that's quite unusual because I mean, uh, as soon as you talk plastic parts, so many people these days ship it, uh, ship everything out. No, I mean there's not, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I, th- I think the issue is, is that from my point of view, is you know I don't have. Um, I don't have the bodies to send out to China to to to, man, to manage a project, and this project has to be very very tightly managed. You know, my my design team got together with a tooling team. We had several days where we all spent time with each other, talking to each other, getting to know each other, were working on the project. Um, you know, gluing kits together, discussing the pros and cons, and doing and all that. So that's been um, fundamentally for a, a, a great part of the project because we actually got to work with these engineers to to learn and then it has been a huge learning curve um and we're now we're now feeling very um confident about our future in plastic because we know what we're doing and and that's so that's pretty cool so cha- i mean you know there's always a challenge uh and i think it's uh, but the, i mean but but the ben- the long term benefits of something like this in plastic are are enormous plastic's not the perfect solution for all of the things we make i mean plastic is i mean from a point of view of um you know, there are certain technical challenges. That, you know, there are things I can do in resin that I can't do in that I can't do in plastic. You know, some of the density of detail that I that I approached some some of the tooling on, um, it made these it made their eyes water. Whereas, whereas in resin, you know, we we can we can layer up the detail level and know that we're going to pull it off because we're good at that and we can do it quickly. So, and also, it, but as soon as you start moving into a, the, the you know the, the the volumes, and that was the halo had to be done in plastic because of volume. Um, you know, I, if I was only going to sell a few thousand boxes, I'd have done it in resin. But the reality is, I'm going to be selling tens of thousands of boxes. So therefore, it's something that had to go into plastic to, to for the sanity of my staff, and also for for a guarantee of a quality threshold on doing a huge volume. So, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't make it a better product than resin. You know, it just it's just it's a different it's just a different mechanic to take things to market. I mean, you know, we we we're good at resin. We you know, we love making resin. You know, we have got some fantastic models coming up for you know for Planet Follow. Our new models that we're working on for dystopian ones are just simply stunning. They're all resin based, and they're just they they're just phenomenal kits. They are. I mean, they are. You know, they're going to blow you away when you see those. But um, so no, you know, challenges. Well, getting just making just just not screwing up is <laughs> probably the big. The whole, like, yeah. Just not, just not making an ass of it, you know. And I think, just, and you just have to stay true to the project and just, you know. Uh, but again, it was easy for me because the guys that, that were at the sharp end of the stick with this, my design team, were, are, are brilliant. They just, they took it in their stride. The, the tooling engineers said that they've, they've rarely worked with people who've embraced a project like this as as well as this and has done such a good job. And that I take that as a massive feather in their cap, you know. When we were down down with you in February, uh, you were looking around saying, uh, "Well, this is all very well, but in order to ca- cope with the volume that, that that we've got to do for Halo, we have to move." Yeah, we got it. That's still a problem. Um, we we had a um, um, a nice new packing, um, but we now don't have a car park anymore at work. We put we put a building in it. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we, our, our, um, our, our landlords, God bless them, made us a new car park around the corner, and we took our car park and put a building in it just to practice, well, basically to manage Halo. Um, yeah, it's an issue. We've been bursting at the seams for quite some time. I think it's one of, it's, it's one of those interesting issues as a business that, you know, when I first started in Somerset, I, I moved to Somerset to retire for an easy life. I didn't, I didn't move there to build a company that would keep growing and growing and growing. So it's a tricky one. You know, we're still looking for more space. We're looking for second sites. And, um, you know, it, we'll, we'll overcome that shortly. Which, you know, it's a nice problem to have. Also a pain in the bum yes. as well, but it's a nice problem to have. Okay, Mr. Whitaker, you're going to ask... You, you, oh, you gee, thanks. So, what's next that you're allowed to tell us about? Or even that you're not allowed to tell us about? <laughs> well, obviously, we're working on the ground game. When the... oh, hang on a second, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Before we start talking about oh, yeah. the ground game... Uh, cause, uh, yeah, you know, already we've been talking about um, uh, the Max and uh, fleet carriers, which don't come in the box. Right, well, let me let me give you um, let me give you an idea of, of, of some of the stuff that's coming. I'm not going to put it in any particular sequence. I'm just going to basically lob it in there. We've got things like the Covenant Assault Carrier. Uh, we've got the um, uh, Trafalgar class supercarrier for the UNSC. We've got the Valiant class super heavy cruiser coming. We've got the Halberd class destroyers. We've got the Mac platforms. We've got the Covenant escorts that I forget the name of. Forgive me. Um, we've got the um, 
Infinite Secor, which is basically a, a covenant support vessel, which is quite a, quite a nifty ship actually. It's it, um, it's it's re- it, it's relatively non-combative in as much as um, what Derek's going to do with it is it basically resupplies covenant ships with more nasty elites to board with. It's one of these things. It's it's got a hunting ground actually on the ship. There's like a bio dome, and inside it is where the elites train. And this thing is a support vessel for the fleet, so it's kind of almost like an aquaponic ship, but it it also uh, kind of like ferries these elites around. So it's during the course of a combat it, of game, it can um, uh, repopulate boarding parties on the Covenant to keep them in the game on on, on the nasties. Of course, we've got um, there's a there's a there's a very long list of models. Then of course, you know, we've kind of got what we call there's Microsoft talk about classic Halo and you know modern Halo. So of course. Um, you know, we we got a whole load of classic stuff that we're working on. We've also what else? Oh, we got the things like the Covenant Destroyer, and then we have got the battleships that we're working on, looking at. But of course, within the within the modern framework, you've then got the Halo Four stuff. So you've got stuff like Infinity, and then you've got other, I guess, for one of but you, you're probably going to see other um, um, kind of forerunner influence type stuff. I guess. I mean, there's there's elements of it that I can't talk about or potentially don't even know yet because I, I, I will take briefings from Microsoft as and when they tell me some of the stuff they want as well. So y- y- there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot there's you know there's a lot of there's a lot of spaceships coming. You know, I, I in, in, in the video yeah. games, Neil, you see a few spaceships, but the reality is that in, you know they've manifested a massive amount of tech. Um, and you don't necessarily always see it. There's also, you know, there's things like graphic novels where stuff. But you know, what we're what we're sort of doing, I guess, is Microsoft will utilise us. Three for three will use us to to take the designs that they want to present out there. So we we will um, be a conduit for what they've been working on stylistically, and some of that will be models that we will design for them, and, and like the. Epoch Carrier and the ORS Heavy Cruiser. Other, others will be ones like the Halberd Cruiser, uh, sorry, the Halberd Destroyer that is theirs, um, that they've already designed, and we will just take that design. Things like the Valiant um, is, a, is a new design by us for Microsoft. Um, the Trafalgar will be... Uh, I mean, uh, our, my guys have been... Um, they, they get to work with people at Microsoft to kind of to come up. So we propose ideas and they kick around and they spitball it and then they, they come back with designs and then the Microsoft come back and say, right, here we go, go and build that and off we pop. Okay. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, you can imagine coming from my guys for, um, for my design to, you know, to be able to, um, to, to, to be part of that process is pretty cool. But don't get me wrong, I get it as well. Okay. I, get, I, mean, I like it as well, don't get me wrong, it's kind of cool. So how are these things likely to be packaged? Only the. <laughs> In a box. Or the sh- well, what we're asking, what I'm, what I'm asking is that you know, you know, in the same way that you've packaged something like Planet Four, where you've got, you know, where basically it's like, okay, you have an assault, uh, an assault helix, a recon helix. You, you go buy yeah. a box. Yeah, yeah. Is it going to be a case of, yeah, you know, these things are going to be individually no, listed? It- in the, in, um, in the same way you've done with stuff in the past, or is it going to be like battle groups? No, it'll be um, it'll be it'll be it'll be a bit of a composite of all sorts. Really, you've got um, there'll be um, the core, the core, some of the core building block areas will be things like if you think about so the both of the fleets come on two sprues. You've got a heavy sprue and a, and a medium small sprue. Um, the heavy sprue has tends to have some smalls with it as well, but they they will they split off to make for um, to kind of a building block approach. So. In the next wave of releases after this one, there'll be there'll be kind of a um, and again, forgive me, I'm probably going to get the name of the box wrong, but there'll be, there'll be, there'll be like a UNSC uh, core box, which which will be more mediums and smalls, and and so you can basically keep adding you know marathons and, and Paris class frigates, and then or if you want more carries, you can basically buy the heavy box, which I think there's two um, there's two epochs in the box, I think if memory serves me, and then the, then the, on the Covenant side there'll be there'll be heavy cruisers, and then same again with the mediums and smalls. So you, people will be able to pad out um, the the kind of the core blocks and the heavier blocks that way. And then regarding um, other models that come out, it'll be a, it'll be done in a kind of an ad hoc basis, basis, depending on the size of the model. So if you look at something like an assault carrier for the Covenant, you, you get one of them. It's, it's a big model, um, and and so you buy you will buy a big model. Now, depending on the type of gamer you are, you you might buy one, you might buy three, you might buy five. It's entirely up to you, but. You buy, you buy them in, in increment, bits like that. Um, something like a Mac platform will probably come in a box with two or three Mac platforms on a sprue. Uh, 
you know, something like a Valiant Super Heavy. There may be one or two of those. They're quite a lot. They're quite a good size model. Those ones, but I'd imagine they'll probably be sold in pairs. And again, again, depending on the the the, the ratio of ships, things like the Sakor, I think is one Sakor and four escorts on a sprue. So there'll be either one or two sprues of that in a box. So it'll be it'll be it'll be a building block approach. It'll be basically um, to make it palatable to custom for people. They can buy what they want to buy, sort of thing. So they won't they won't be expected because we don't have the concept of a pre-described battle group as such. Um, people will will be given the option to just buy the pieces, build it up how they want to build their forces. And are you looking at expanding into uh, the other periphery pro- products for the game? So looking at perhaps things like you know battle mats and uh, and other terrain. And stuff? We are the, the the difficult thing with some of those things is from our point of view is is, is making sure that we can air ship it. Um, and get it to the states and places. Mm-hmm. There's an awful lot of our marketplaces in North America, um, but also make sure that it's not it's it, it's done at a competitive price. You know, we've always priced fairly for the customer. That that's you know that's our kind of guiding principle at, at Smart and Games is to make sure that we you know we we you know we, we price well for the customer. So some of those ancillary products that, uh, would be hard for us to add a distribution margin because we are a distribution based company. Um, to get the price right, so we may not be the best vehicle to make all of those things for the customer. They may be they may be able to find more palatable pricing from dealing direct to some companies. But you know, no, it's definitely certain things that we're looking at. We just finished a, a project to start making the new asteroids and things for um, well, not only Halo but for Firestorm as well. So we've got we've got a whole range of um, asteroids with modular scenery to go on them and things like that. So they're, they're, in fact, you'll see you, when you get the rule book, you can see photographs of of that scenery in the rule book because we we completed those in time for the rule book and sort of things like that. Um, but no, you know, it's the it's it, there's a, there's always a it's always a want to try and do all things you can, but sometimes it's it's, it's hard to actually do them all sensibly. You know, you have to kind of draw a line as to what you can and can't do. You know, there'll be dice and things. So big area. One thing that I am quite excited by are the uh, the fleet commander bus because we we you probably saw some of the ones that we did as freebies at Salute, but they, we've actually um, productized a number of the, or, or started to productize those into into retail product for customers. So you kind of get um, the bust and a little plinth that he stands in and, and then the kind of the dice holder for when he puts his command dice in they're, they're really rather spiffy actually I'll, uh, I'll send you a picture of them yeah they were quite cool yeah yeah, yeah we saw a couple yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're an interesting uh, characterization for the game because obviously you know if you want to if you're you know if you're if you're into, if you're into the UNSC and you, you want to um, Michael Stanford thing you want to Cortana or some other hero or a Spartan or something then having having those busts them and they're not they won't be for everybody which is why that mechanically in the game you're not forced to buy them. If you want to own the, the extra bit of gubbins, then 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 so be it. It's kind of cool, you know. But you can't you can't you can't make people buy things just to play the game. That's all a bit wrong, really. And, and at the same time, they yeah, they suddenly become little kind of collectible things on their own, don't they? You, you, you know, some you know some people are into Halo, they turn around and go, "Hey, look, you know, whilst you may not want the the fleet game, you got you got these cool busts." Yeah, you know, and, and, and character things that people want, you know, uh, might want to get. How could somebody not want fleet, the fleet game? I mean, come on. Well, I, I know it's a strange concept <laughs> to consider, but it, 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 no. you know, it it's, it's one of these things of, of catering to multiple markets. No, I agree. No, no, I, do, I think there will be people who potentially will buy um, the, the the fleet game to get the models as desk ornaments. You know. I mean, they may never yeah. play a game, but they want to make just they want to make the ships. Yeah, because most people want a Covenant fleet carrier to go on. Yeah, them. well, you know, I mean, yeah, I, on your one. <laughs> uh, but yes, no. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I say most monitors you can only fit yeah. one. I've got three of my. Uh, you know, I, I, know you, I know you have big monitors for what you. Know. <laughs> I got three of my desk actually. Yeah, it's quite funny. But no, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can we can and can't do with the game. I think it's sort of, I think yeah. At the end of the day, we're building war game. You know, there are there are many other companies out there that can build the collectibles and, other, and some of the other funny stuff. So that's not that's not actually our license doesn't um, cover things like that. We are building the war game, but of course within that are certain ancillary products that we can that we will be able to, to make. But I think it's over time there'll, there'll be a lot of fun stuff coming. I'm, I'm looking forward to next year when I get to make Infinity properly. You know, I've got I've got Infinity. Uh, you know, we 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 built it, and but um, but you know, 
you know, but but it's it's kind of a cool ship. So it's sort of I'm, I mean I'm looking forward to kind of being able to play my game and then doing a what a what if scenario and stick two or three of those buggers on the table. Happy days. <laughs> yeah, good. absolutely. That's that dishes out the dirt, that one. So yeah, no, um lots of things to do. Um but again, you know, it's sort of um nice and steady, do you know, kind of um uh, you know, again working with three four three to make sure that what we build is what they want. So what can you tell us about the ground game? It's it's ridiculously cool. Sold. Well, the models aren't cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're still there, Dan? Yes, funny. I'm still here. <laughs> I don't know, I don't right, know well, what we should say, really. Um, it, I, I, I can do a bit of a preamble on it quickly, and then, uh, and then basically... Then, 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 it's... Like the like the spaceship game, it, it's all about you know it, 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 it's 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 two audiences are going to it's going to embrace it. You've got the war gamers and the normal and the normal gamers, so you've got to build a game that is you know fast fluid. Everything that we do in the ground in the spaceship game has got to be captured and presented in terms of the, of the same stylization and gameplay in the, in the, in this. So it's got to be it's cinematic. It's got to be exciting. It's got to, it's mass battle because it was, it's his 15 mil scale, one 100 scale. It's got to have all of the characters in there. It's got to have, you know, the vehicles in there, the stuff that people are used to seeing, uh, the warthogs, the scorpion tanks, the, the, the bands, you know, the, the, well, the, 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 well, the pelican drop ships, the, all of the stuff that you want to see, um, you know, kind of, um, wraiths and ghosts and things. And easy to play, and again using a commonality of engines, so basically making it so that anybody can transition between the two systems, and you know again carrying forward stuff like the commanders. So instead of having a fleet commander, you'd have a ground commander. Instead of having you know, but but it, you know some of your heroes and characters can still be the same. So you know, you know what what Cortana can do, whether she's in space or influencing the ground game. Likewise, Master Chief, whether he's on the spaceship or on the ground. Um, the different characters. It's that that's that ebb and flow, and again, keep a similar game style to um, to what we've got in space. However, you probably kind of more of a flip on it, where you've, you've got probably more. Um, whereas in space, you kind of got more UNSC to less Covenant on a ground game. I think you probably you probably see that as a reverse principle. But you know, Derek. Yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> no, the there's. We've, we've, when we've designed the, the ground game was written at exactly the same time as the space game with the intention that oh, right. we would have commonality. Um, if somebody can play the space game, they will be able to play the ground game because the two systems are designed to use the same dice mechanics and the same um, commander mechanics, the same methods for doing firing solutions and things like that. So it'll all be exactly the same. The statistics will be very simple. We'll, because of the dice mechanics, everything will flow into that. So what should, it should be the case that anybody who can play the fleet game can play the ground game. So that, as Neil pointed out, people have got these frames of reference in space and they've, these people have got the same frame of reference on the ground combat and we have to be able to manifest each of those things happening. You know, I'm very confident with them, with the ground game as well as the, the, the space game because the, the engines are so similar. And that's something that's that's really interesting to try and do is to write an engine that can play in com- two completely separate environments. It's like a, a fleet battle game and a ground combat game are very very different. So the so the challenge of making the same mechanic work. For yeah, well, that's the benefit yeah. of the pool system, isn't it? That the pool system allows us to do that, and of course, with the commonality of the orders and the commonality of the statistics through the firepower table. You know, you can imagine that a mo- you would move down a firepower rating. You'd be your firepower rating would retard if you had um, cover in the way, for example. Now that's that happens in mm. in Halo Fleet battles. If you're shooting through a gas cloud, you you suffer a penalty to your rating. And the same thing's true if you're shooting at somebody in soft cover, like a, a small wood or something like that. You would suffer a penalty. So the commonality of the factors still there. We just just people need to realise um, where that factor comes from, and of course the the space game will provide a fantastic grounding basis, to to use a word, to move into the ground game. Yeah, we don't we don't yeah. necessarily blow units up with bombs or that count down, but you know. also there's certain crazy stuff like like things like um, with Spartans. You know, if you if you were to just model a Spartan in the game. Uh, as as per the way they are created to be the super soldiers, then basically I've got a Spartan, you're dead, goodbye. You know, so so what we've done is Spartans, we we utilise them to, um, in, I'm going to use the word enhance 
the units around them with eagles and things, but they they kind of interact and do stuff with that, and so they're not necessarily designed to be a rampaging killing machine. So some of these things, they they, they won't you won't build an army that's just a bunch of Spartans that you're going to just win with. It's not it's not that's not what the game is. This is about UNSC Marine Corps. You know, it's the it's it's, it's the army. It's the army doing the best with the yeah. with the characters of the of of Spartans in play. You know, but but you know, potentially and unless Derek tells me I'm wrong this one, you know, in the game you can see you know you can see a Spartan jump into a tank and he runs around and shoots things. And if Absolutely. Tanker- that that's one of the core mechanics. Any character can join any unit. And in some cases you'll actually be able to, to remodel the vehicle to put the Spartan on it. Um you know, so you could, you know, yeah. take the take the gunner out of a warthog and have a Spartan firing that cannon. A nice clear representation that that's a Spartan doing the dirty on you there. And of course, when that vehicle dies, the Spartan makes his heroic save. He lands on terra firma, then goes to join another squad. Because, you know, that's basically what he is. He, needs, he can only be good if other people are watching. Generally, when I make that rule, not. Oh, yes. Well, that's the only time that you hear cheers in the office, actually, is when Neil loses his Spartan. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to be all too common now. I'm to think, I'm to think, yeah, it's I'm sad because the whole the whole place stops and everybody comes to watch, and it puts a really unfair pressure on you, Neil. But uh, you know, it's amazing how many times you cock it up and roll that stuff. I'm starting to think actually that somebody keeps giving me a dodgy die. Actually, oh right? well, no, that would be incredibly unsporting, and if that were to be the case. Then you know we would we would be found out. <laughs> no, we've not. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that for all the confidence. <laughs> uh, dear. So, what sort of size um, is the grand gun? I, I, again, yeah, yeah obviously we yeah. fifteen mil, which I suppose for a lot of people that uh, that would have been a surprise in itself. As a- if you think about twenty eight mil, you've got you get twenty eight mil with the video game. That's what the tw- that's what that gives you. Um, I mean, we 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 sat and we when we when we first approached it, we we sat and we we, we thought about well, we, what would we want to build? So we actually we, we sat and we we built mechanically um, all sorts. We 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 were on the fifty mil, but we built the twenty eight mil. We built the ideas up for the. 50, I mean, we we even built fifty four mil skirmish version of it as well. You know, in our head, you know, we went and we did it because. We were sat looking at you know what could this universe present, and we you know we, we Derek and I, Derek and I are bloody addicts to this. We you know we can't we can't help ourselves, and and we we, we put all of the bits in there. So whether Microsoft so if Microsoft had sent to us and said look we want twenty eight mil, we'd have just built it. It would have been it would not have been it would have phased us. Um, but the reality is that we had, the discussion was about the fact that we want to present the armored side, you know the, the ground combat, the actual the troops behind the Spartans. And 15 mil was it, it. It was the scale we had to select because if we, if they come to us and said um, we just want we we want it all tanks, it's all about tanks, then we'd have probably done it in 10 mil because you know we do great 10 mil, we do a planet for, um, you, you know we'd have, we'd have done that, you know, and then if we'd have wanted it to be you know, really um, massively, massively sort of large scale tanks, I guess we'd have done six mil. But there, you know, we we you know, we did we. Ten, we didn't. We, 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 it's an infantry game. So, you know, it's all about the. It's all about these wonderful marines um, fighting this kind of like last ditch effort against this, this marauding covenant that's coming in to slap them about. Um, so here we have it, fifteen mil, and Microsoft very very pleased with that. Um, very happy with that. Um, and size wise, well, yeah, good question actually, Derek. One uh-huh. for you that one, mate. Why did we choose fifteen? Oh no, no, I think. I think the, the, no. question, the uh, question is how many toys on the table. Oh right, well, um, I suppose it's it's pretty comparable to um, the fleet battles game. It, it can be as big as your table requires it to be. I mean, we've been we've certainly tested the ground combat game with well, we see about be four platoons and six vehicle squadrons. So yeah, that, that's if you're counting each little base of infantry as. As one, that's over 200 models a side. So, you know, we've been playing that, and that's, well, obviously, that's a bloodbath. <laughs> it is an absolute bloodbath. Yeah. Um, but Sounds awesome. We, we test, we test to yeah. really big scales <laughs> because we need to see everything happening at the same time. We, there's no point in suddenly, you know, not getting to see something get tested because it died before it got a chance to do anything. So we put eight of it down. 
And so eventually one of those eight will get on and, and do what it needs to do. And that's why we do our testing in such large scale. Um, you know, a, a nice game for people. You know, let's say you've got a kind of a four before table or four before whatever. You know, you know, a scorpion tank, two or three warthogs, and then I don't know what do you reckon, Derek? Twenty, thirty basis figures. It's a, it's a, it's a couple of combat. Um, you know? so yeah, it's about. So that, it's, that's it's that's that, 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 that that'll give you a really nice flavoursome game, and of course, then you know, you start ro- rolling in more armour. Then you, of course, you you can have stuff where your pelicans are bringing in support, so they can be kind of dropping in. Um, you know, you know. So let's say I I have a particularly bad assault down one flank, and I managed to blow it, get one of my scorpions. Um, to, potentially, I may have a commanding officer who's got access to the asset. He might, he, I might be able to call a pelican in and actually bring in because in the game, if you watch the play the video game, you'll see those things dropping in bloody troops and pelicans and and yeah. scorpion tanks and warthogs. So that so mechanically, we have to represent that in the game, the ability to kind of reinforce at that sort of level. So, yeah. so you know, but again, that you know, you're not going to have access to a ton of that asset, so you have to use it kind of like accordingly. But it's the, it's, the, it's my ability that I may be able to reinforce myself if I've done a particularly bad action on a flank or something, and you know, I lost a rather nice scorpion tank, which is a shame of a thing to do, really, because they're rather lovely tanks. Yes, you've done a good job of them, and and yes, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I say we haven't seen a, a fantastic number of models for this at the moment. But it, I mean, uh, I think the, the, the warthogs have just arrived in time. For- yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you got, you're going to have your usual thing. You're going to have your kind of your grunts and your grunt sheep and whatever they call them. And uh, I always forget, I forget the name. Not, I don't get an old man. You get the miners and the majors. Yeah, the miners yeah, and the majors. Like, so you can, you know, and, and you got the kind of uh, the hunters and the elites and the um, well, the, the zealots, like, and we have yeah. the um, skirmisher um, That's right. folks as well. And yeah, we've got the jackals, of course. So yeah, there's 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 lots and lots of depth. Of course, the Covenant have got the widest array of infantry types, but um, with the UNSC, it's important that we're able to manifest different types of platoon, so that you can have a reconnaissance platoon, a heavy weapons platoon, a rifle platoon. You can have an anti-aircraft platoon, which if you're worried about getting dumped on by airdrops from the Covenant, you know, you do all that hard work, and the Covenant come along and ruin it by adding a whole load of grunts and elites into a, a battle formation again. Then you take your anti-air units to make sure that those get shot down before they come in. Yeah, so the the, the important thing about that uh, air drop thing that Neil was talking about is that's actually a direct transposition of the wings phase in the, the fleet battles game. So instead of it being called wing phase, it's called air drop phase. And that's the point where your elements come in. So the, the, the game mechanic, the flow of the mechanics don't change. It's just a new phase fits in and replaces an old phase. Yeah. Also, don't forget, it's not all just on the ground. Exactly. So that air phase is not just air drops. It could be attack sorties from banshees coming in. I, I did hear you mention the aerial game briefly a little earlier. <laughs> No, I was just assuming when you said aerial game, you were talking about the. Uh, uh, you were talking about. Might you be wrong. <laughs> oh, right. And right at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> there's, 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 yes. there's that as well, because the aerial helixes for Planetfall are pretty drop dead. And they're just the first ones you're going to see as well. Uh, well you, nice. You've seen the pictures, though, rather than. <laughs> yeah, you showed, you showed the pictures the other night. And it was like, ooh, they're nice. <laughs> All right, so we're getting that in Halo. Well, yeah, but, well, it's steady. but but also when I say that it's not on the ground, I mean, you know, that you're not you're just going to see these 15 mil troops fighting on the ground. Uh, silence. I love silence. I love it when I confuse people. That's about, that's about a tenth of a Halo's worth of silence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so we're, okay, if if they're not just fighting on the ground, where or, or what else? Someone got how much flesh? So, uh, uh, how so flesh do I have to put about, on the bone? Uh, Come on, if they're not on the planet, where might well, they be fighting? Well, I was I was going to say obviously, yeah, we've been talking about things like boarding actions and various other bits and pieces, and um, <laughs> yeah, how cool would it be? So fighting? so so twenty five pelicans make a rapid combat insertion into a CCS battle cruiser. Battle cruiser. And they bring, they drop off, you know, five marine sections and, you know, some other bits and pieces of juicy kit like ODST, spike troops, and a couple of Spartans. And the mission is to fight your way across a six by four board to get to a control room. 
And the Covenant player has to set his defences based upon the fact that he knows he's got enemy incoming. And so there's you're going to be mini you're going to be making to there. you're going to be making some really tasty scenery for that, aren't you? It's certainly feasible. Maybe. It's definitely possible. It's definitely within the realms of possibility, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my fishing rod away. In the um, in, in the Scottish vernacular, that's called Mibby's eye, Mibby's no. <laughs> 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 oh I was wondering how long it take a rap scene this, but they come yeah, out Thank you very much. My iron yeah. brew ran out, that's why I feel myself devolving. Just, just, go, just go away and take your, it'll be a, that, your string vest off. Oh dear. Anyway, yes, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of good fun All stuff right. coming. So now it's, um, it, I would be an absolute liar if I didn't tell you it was like, it was like waking up in a candy store. <laughs> you know. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the options are just tremendous. They're very, very exciting. And of course, you know, this is, this is, think about this as the action. We've already got this rather tasty cake that's our other systems. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got all oh, this yeah, other cool yeah, stuff yeah. that we like making. And then on top of this, we've got this, this icing called, called Halo. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Okay. So obviously, Halo Fleet Battles come, uh, is, is released on the, on the 20th. It certainly is. Um, and uh, amongst other things, of course, that happens to be around right about the same time as Gen Con. It, it does, ish. Which is, which is ish. I mean, it, yeah, it's within a couple of weeks near, so it's 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 place it's to visit nice the states. It's it's quite nice. Yeah. Yes. So you're going over to Gen Con. Yeah, I want to be. I want to spend. My, I'll be spending most of my time in 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 in, in meeting rooms at three four three. Um, so I'll be, I mean, I'll be there. I mean, my, we, we're there at Gen Con. It's our first visit. So we, we, we basically, we get to put our name on the list and, um, you know, sure willing. And then, you know, for when we can kind of be there with a, with a proper decent presence, hopefully next year. Um, so I think, I, don't know. I, I, I mean, the thing that, so the, the thing that gets me about that is, I, I mean, obviously, you know, Gen Con have their, ha, have their way of doing things. And if it's your first time, you're going to be shoved in a corner somewhere with, Probably one of the biggest releases of the show. Um, well, <laughs> y- yes, I mean, uh, but I think you know, I mean, fair. Play, uh, they, they 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 build a level playing field, I believe, and I think that's a good, that's a good thing. And I think um, no, everybody you know just deserves a fair crack of the whip at these things. So no, we have you know this is our first time. We do answer it. We're not you know we're not a we're not a show oriented company. We you know we you know we're, we're down in the bowels of Somerset and we tend to just get on with it. And by the, by the time we get to the weekends, most of my guys don't want to work. You know, they want to kind of have a couple of days off so they can go and rest. Um, so we don't do that many shows. I mean, we did salute. We had great fun. I took a, I took the vast majority of the, the, the team up there. They had a wonderful time. They really enjoyed it. Um, judging by the amount of beer they drank the night before. You know, so I think Gen Con is, is it, it's, it's a good departure for us because obviously we get to go over there and meet a lot of our American distributors and people. Um, we've got um, the, the, the nice people at War Store are, are, are going to let us be on their stand as well. So we've got a, we've got a Halo demo table there with those guys. Um, so yeah, we we got a we have a um, cozy little stand um, tucked away, and but my guys will be there and they're, they're looking forward to speaking to people and seeing everybody. Um, and then I'll be kind of um, uh, a scone stuff in meetings, plotting and planning and rolling dice and talking about what's next. Desperately badgering the the three four three people to tell me more about Halo, and then they kind of like they give me this kind of stony silence of I can't tell you that because you're not you know we'd have to kill you first or <laughs> afterwards. Oh right, <laughs> oh right, so if you, oh, yeah, yeah, so even you. No, can well, have... I mean, whether there's only so there's only so much access that would that would allow us as a licensee. I mean, I mean, clearly we we you know we we have an understanding of what's going on, but you know it what these guys have got. Tremendous plans, and um, you know we're we're, sort of, we're we're privy to elements of it, but only when it has direct relationship to what we're doing with the license. So, uh, I mean, you know, I'd love to be able to sit there and tell you that I know all about Halo Twenty Six, <laughs> you know. Um, but it, it, that you know, we're, we're, that's you know, we're we we lower down the pecking the pecking order and important parts things like that. Okay, so, so so one thing we uh, we can hopefully talk about is is, is, is potential release schedules, uh, yeah, or or, or or more to the point, I want to know when I, I, I want to know when I can buy my assault. Uh, or can you tell me? I, I can, <laughs> but I'm delighted to give you one if you want one. I mean, if you want this, if you want an assault carrier, that much, you give me a shot. I'll give you one next time you come to the office. Take one now. 
That shut him up. <laughs> that's that's impressive. <laughs> that was good. That 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 I mean, I mean, I've got a box of them. It's okay. <laughs> full of them if you want it. <laughs> I can't. I mean, these things are all, um, you know, they're, they're all connected up, and it, it's a lot of it's not necessarily my say. So when when th- things can kind of go public, and so there's a whole... okay. So you can't tell us that, uh, you can't tell us whether or not we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to be able to bomb, uh, buy the grand game as a Christmas present. I can't. No. You can just not which year. Ah, that's, 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 that's a good answer. I like that one, actually. No, I'm not that mean, actually. No, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I mean, well, no, 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 you know, in, in, thinking about it, I don't actually like you enough. <laughs> Was that the wrong thing to say, Derek? Oh, Neil, I like you. I, I'll tell you, but not today. No. <laughs> not today. Much closer to the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah or at least not when, 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 it's, when it's public knowledge. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm an ex-journalist. I know they're off the road by this load of bollocks. Yeah, there's no such thing. Well, guys, I'd love to ask you about everything else that you're doing, but especially considering we've already taken up the vast majority of your evening, I think that's going to be. No, well, thank, well, thanks for putting up with us. To be honest with you, no, you, you, it's been you, a real you, pleasure. I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed you've chatting. Got amazing experience to get through us. <laughs> 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 Well, we are going to have to have you back on to chat about everything other than Halo you're doing because, I mean, I mean, you were teasing me the other night with some of the stuff that you're doing just for Planetfall. You know, it's like um, when you say uh, things like you were teasing me. You know, I, I think you just, I'd rather you rephrase some of these things now, actually. Yeah, well, at least not about. have that really long pregnant pause after it. <laughs> I know, I know. kind of <laughs> weird. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let it hang like that. It's it like, felt Ugh. Freudian. It really did. It was quite scary. <laughs> we are, we, yeah, well, we got all, we got all that stuff. We got all, we got all of the the Planet Four stuff. We've been we've been rocking and rolling behind the scenes on Planet Four, and uh, you know we got uh, the, the Covenant are now finished for for Legion, so we know we're about to uh, lure those boys out. And we're ploughing through the Russians, you know. So so very shortly, Legion, so we, we'll be a complete set of figures. Um, you know, we've got um, all the, the new cool stuff for 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 developers. I was looking, I was watching the, one of the guys put the finishing touches. <laughs> Fantastic uh, Empire of the Blazing Sun, um, rather large robot today, which was just the coolest thing, and um, so that was kind of fun. And of course, we've got a we've got an amusing blast from the past coming for people, which is going to, going to be fun. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, I've got my new pet project, which is my new fir- my new one that I did, I built for me, which is, we're going to roll up, which is which even which is fun. Um, and you know, got the, the... oh, is that uh, is that the one you were showing me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, be, uh, 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 you, you're actually going to be producing that. I am. I took, I took the decision. Oh, fantastic! I took the decision to take the um, indulgence of the boss of the company and to productize it because it's just, the amount of people that said to me that is so cool, I want to own it. I thought, oh, okay, fine. Who the hell am I to say no? Um, and then, of course, we got a bag of stuff for Firestorm. So no, it's. Um, it's it's really funny. We, we even though we've been sort of really really busy with Halo, we've we, the guys have just been. It's it's sort of odd. It's one of the, I guess one of the advantages of tooling and plastic is that there are periods of time whereby um, you know we, we 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 send the designs off, and then of course we've got two or three weeks where we're waiting for some feedback. So my guys just basically just hammer the models out. Um, so it's kind of it's really it's really sort of weird. It kind of it's working incredibly well because. It, it, we've actually allowed it's kind of allowed us to load balance the two formats between the guys and um you know that they, they they've managed to move between the plastic tooling and you know dystopian was giant robots and um yeah. to the other fun stuff uh, and incredibly kept me happy except for those nights when I was really sad because I was working, you know, kind of like 63 hours over four days or something because I was um, knee-deep in work and thinking, oh, my God, I need to go home at some point. I must stop sleeping on the sofa. (laughs) 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 Right, so this whole theory about moving to Somerset to retire then is just um, uh, the plan still isn't working. Yeah, it's fair to say I goosed that one, actually. I I, I think it's actually a vicious plan by, by my wife to make up for my years of laziness. 
because when you first knew me, I was I was just bumming around like a lazy sod, and um, I think this is actually her way of getting her own back on me. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's got to be. It, it, there's nothing else can explain it to be honest with you. It seems a particularly <laughs> bizarre sort of revenge. Yeah, uh, well, you know, she's a bizarre woman, really. She might me. She's the official MD of the company, isn't she? She is. She's creative for him. Yeah, I'm the fluffy one. Basically, she's the, she's a sensible one. No, basically, without Francis, the company wouldn't run. Um, I mean, well, it would. I mean, I'd run it into a brick wall. I mean, I would actually. I, we, we, me and Derek, commonly joke about the fact that I would be surrounded by the world's most amazing toys, and I'd be living in a cardboard box, and I'd never sold anything. Them. <laughs> and I'd be, yeah, but I would have, but I would have these fantastic toys. But I'd never have actually ever got round to selling anything because I'd have forgot yeah, the amount of products in my building that we've designed where people say, that's really cool, do you sell that? And I'm like, no, I forgot to sell that one. But it's really nice, isn't it? (laughs) 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 So so even now you're still learning the concept of commercial business? (laughs) I I, I mean, mean, I've got got, um, got a set of 96, uh, something like 96, 28 mil fantasy figures I made for Uncharted Seas. Oh, Dragon Lords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dragon yeah, I remember Lords. those. Yes. So, I mean, I've just got a whole set of those buggers. I don't know anything with them. So, I mean, you know, um, you know, I've got all. I mean, there's tons. Of, there's all the Greek forty mil stuff that we don't do anything with anymore. I mean, and there's a ton of stuff there that we never ever even released. People like Hercules and um, Medusa and all that sort of stuff. And then, it's, <laughs> yeah, just you know, anyway, made me happy. But yes, it's not retirement. It's an odd retirement. But it's a fun one, though. Except for that time when I met Derek. I don't know, man. I was hoping we get to the end of the show before you insulted him. No, not a chance. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, what, it's what keeps us going. It does. I, I keep, yeah. I, I keep, I'm trying to make up for that two-hour bollock and he gave me when he first met me. <laughs> I like to think of it as a constructive appraisal. Right, yes. You call it what you want, boy. I will. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> we'll just quietly fade into the background and leave these guys bickering like an old married couple, shall we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sounds like a plan to me. Listen, guys, uh, thank you very much for having us. It's been fun. It's been a real pleasure, chaps. It's you're welcome. It, it's been tremendous, guys. It has been tremendous. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been great to chat. So, that was the interview. Uh, I hope you found out a whole lot of stuff about uh, about Halo that you didn't know before. Now, at the start of the show, I introduced three hosts. Um, myself, Mr. Whitaker, and uh, Mr. Hobbs. And up until this point, we really haven't heard from Mr. Hobbs. Uh, that's because Mr. Hobbs was our secret weapon. Because we recorded uh, the interview with uh, Derek and Neil on the... Oh, when was it? The 11th, 11th of July? Friday, wasn't it? Friday, yeah. Yeah, it was a Friday. Yes, it was, it was the 10th. We recorded that on the 10th. And a couple of days ago, Mr. Hobbs actually went down to Spartan's house, didn't he? I did. So I went there. He went there and you got to play. I did, yeah. So, uh, you, so, so now you, you can come back and you can tell us all the secrets that Neil and Derek couldn't tell us. Can't yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't tell you those. Oh. Um... <laughs> But I can tell you the game's good. <laughs> okay, okay. So we've heard a lot about yeah, we've heard a lot about it from from the designers' point of view and uh, and what have you. But uh, yeah, w- w- yeah, what's your take on the game and the models and everything else? I don't know any, anything at all about Halo. I, I've never played the computer games, so I'm just approaching it as a, a pure war gamer playing a game, and um, I liked it. It was really good. You've the way that the fleet are put together is nice and simple. Uh, the way that the movement and the combat and the activations work, again, it's really, really simple, but it's got a lot of depth to it, which is just what you want. They're obviously pushing the game at probably a, a non-war gaming market. Hmm. But that being said, they are, they, they do know that, you know, this is going to be bought by war gamers. So they're going to, there's enough in there for a war gamer 
to enjoy. But with the expansions and stuff that can be added to it, I think it's just going to get deeper and deeper and add more tactical um, nuances to the whole game. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we, would, we were there. I thought I'd be, I'd be there for about an hour just chatting to them. But I was there for about four or five hours in the end. Oh, wow. Okay. The models that I saw are really good. The plastics are fantastic quality, really are good. Um, but the game itself is good. It's, it's a really good fun game and you can play big games on, you know, on a, on a decent sized table. There is almost two games in, in one because you've got the fighter combat going on. Yeah. So that's going on in the middle. That does have an effect on the main game. Yeah. You've, you've got the command and control aspects. You've got these commanders that can add, you know, just, just tweaks to various attacks and defenses. So you've got that resource management going on. Um, the models are stunning. <laughs> I really like the models. So yeah, it's there's nothing not to like. Some of the plans that they've they've sort of mentioned to me, I think it just can be great. It's just really going to add to it. Mm-hmm. There's, there's not much else to say really about it because you know, I, I I physically can't say much about it <laughs> because of various NDAs. But I think it'll fly out. I think it'll do really well. The one thing I will say is when the game does come out is what what Neil has said is the the bases for the for the ships they're um they're clear plastic so the injection molded plastic yeah. and they're a, a 60 mil by 60 mil base with 25 holes in it for basically putting these pegs in oh yeah this yeah this is what so yeah. this is what uh, this is the, what, what Neil and Derek were talking about during the interview yeah yeah <laughs> but because it's clear plastic clear plastic is really really brittle and anybody who's ever bought a Games Workshop kit with a flight stand in it will know this. <laughs> yeah. Or even an Airfix one. Or even yeah, an Airfix that, one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, because cause effectively, that's what plastic hasn't changed since you got things like Airfix flight canopies, has it? It's, it's, no, it's, no, it's, it's just exactly the same stuff. brittle is a very yeah. brittle thing. Yeah, it's really, really brittle. And apparently doing a 60 mil base with 25 holes in there, um, goes against all physical <laughs> things there. And Neil had lots of fights with their plastic people about how to do this. So the, be careful. The plastic is brittle. I, I was down there and I was taking a few off the sprue. Um, I, I did manage to, uh, to damage one base because I was a bit ham fisted. So be very careful taking the flight stands off. The rest of the plastic looks great, but just be careful. But that. it's, it's, it's definitely a case for get yourself a pair of those army painters, side cutters and don't try twisting it off. Oh, yeah, well, it's actually really thick tabs, which are uh, between the base and the sprue. There's a sort of like a five mil flat tab going into each base. Well, there's three of them. So cut off at the sprue point using a very sharp knife or clippers and then clip next to the base. So there you go. That's, that's my top tip for oh, him. top tip. I'm so glad I broke a nose and not, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. But, but they got lots of them. <laughs> they could... yeah. Yes, they've been very busy. And the other thing I, I did like, I mean, we played when we, when I was down there, we played with just the contents of the core box. Yeah. And you know, normally you, you get a core box from a game and it's, it's a bit sort of light, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it, yeah, as you say, it, it's, it's, it's like you're playing, you're playing half a game. Yeah. yeah. This isn't, this, you've got a good hour and a half game in there. You know, you, 50 odd ships, you're going to get three battle groups on the Covenant side and probably four battle groups on the U, UNC side, UCN, whatever they're called. UNC, yeah. Yeah, that's the ones, yeah. Um, you know, so, it's a good sized game. It'll play really well on a bit, probably a little bit cramped on a 4x4, four four, plays brilliantly on a 6x4. And that's just the core box or anything else. Cool. Mm. Cool. And we've got lots of nice toys coming out. For, for, yeah, I mean, even from the small bits we've seen already. I mean, you know, if you went to get, if you went to, to salute, you'll have seen the, uh, the weapons platforms for the USNC. You'll have seen a couple of assault carriers. Uh, there's, uh, and, you know, Derek and Neil have been talking about loads of ships and the extra bits and pieces that, they're, that they're getting to design. Mm. This is going to be a big game, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's going to be lots and lots and lots of stuff out for this. 
I don't. I, I don't remember being quite as excited about a game release for a while. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I am. I am really, really looking for. I, I mean, yeah, you know, Planetfall was a really nice surprise. But ever since I heard about this, I've been. I've been so looking forward to this. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, you know, it's like kid at Christmas. It really is. It's, uh, yeah, I've been really looking forward to this. Hopefully, by the time you listen to this, you might have to have chance to uh, to get hold of a copy. And uh, and please let us know what you think. Uh, you know. Um, let us know. Have have you have you been talking the biggest load of rubbish for the last uh, for the last six months, or you know, um, does it meet your expectations? What do you think of it? We, 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 we really would be interested to hear what your views are of the game. You know, once you've seen it, once you've had a chance to play it, let's, yeah, let's enter into a dialogue about this, and uh, yeah, yeah, we'd like to know what you think. But don't, yeah, but let, yeah, let's be let's be constructive. So, like, if you don't like the game, don't just say I don't like it. Tell us why you don't like it, and then we can have a discussion about it. You'll be able to say, well, yeah, okay, you know, you don't like it because of X, Y, and Z. Well, let's discuss X, Y, and Z, and let's have a look at why they, you know, perhaps why they did that way or what have you. It's always good for a chat, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Cool. Well, Mike, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you for going to Spartan and and, and sharing and coming back and managing not to uh, breach any NDAs <laughs> 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 by basically not telling us anything. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we're not bitter at all. <laughs> not at all, no. That's only twice he's been without me now. You should move a bit closer then. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Admittedly, of the three of us, he is by far the closest. <laughs> <laughs> Several hundred miles, in fact. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. It's, it's the only war games club that's really close to me. I'm taking advantage. Uh, Ed. Okay, so uh, so that was Halo Fleet Battles. Thank you once again to uh, Mike Whitaker and Mike Hobbs. Uh, thank you again to Neil Fawcett and Derek Sinclair for uh, for agreeing to come on the show, uh, and hopefully we'll get them back on uh, in the next few months, maybe just before the the ground combat game gets released, uh, whenever that is, when because they refuse to tell us. Uh, <laughs> Although we didn't try. Not that we didn't try yet, as you heard. Not that we didn't try. Um, I have a, I have a sneaking, I have a sneaking suspicion it could could be to do with some sort of national holiday that we may get get close to near the end of, near the end of the year. But you never know. We'll get them back on the show to talk all about uh, the ground game and then what's happening with uh, what's happening with everything else. And of course, what's happening with the rest of Spartan stuff because. As they kind of hinted at, throughout all this, Spartan are not standing still, and some of the stuff they're bringing out. I mean, okay, uh, my primary interest is Planetfall, uh, and, uh, and and looking at what they're doing with Planetfall at the moment, well, they've got some seriously nice stuff coming out of that. With that, all I have to say is thanks for listening. Until next time, it's goodbye from all of us. Happy Cheerio. gaming. We'll speak to you very soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you want to know more about Meeples and Miniatures, there are several things you can do. First of all, you can visit the website at www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. If you want to contact the show at all, you can email me at neil at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. You can follow the show on Twitter. Simply look for M&M Podcast or click the Follow Us on Twitter button from the website. We also have a group on Facebook. That's the Meeples and Miniatures Podcast Fan Club. Again, follow the link from the website. And finally, if you want to help to support the show, you can always donate to the podcast by clicking the PayPal button on the donate page. Again, found on the website. Once again, thank you for listening. I hope you've really enjoyed the show. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.